to start off with to just run through the agenda. So I'm going to start by just sharing some information on the graph reporting framework with you. So that will be for 2021-22 as well as um, beyond that. Then I'm going to hand over back to Janine to take you through some slides on applying substance over form and what that means for you as a preparer of financial statements. She'll also discuss with you the effects of past decisions on materiality. And then we will take a short break after that, just so that you can stretch your legs a little bit. Then I'll be back to discuss some results of a review that we did on Grab 24 with you. And um, there are a number of new FAQs that we've issued that I'll briefly take you through. I'll then hand over to my colleague Amanda Bueta and she will end us off by taking you through some of the new exposure drafts that we have available for comment, as well as what um, is going on in the international environment. So please stay tuned, there is a lot to come. So let's look at the reporting framework. Um, so what I'm talking about is the annual graph reporting framework that the board publishes in Director 5 on determining the graph reporting framework. So that, um, that document Director 5 in itself shows you the changes to the reporting framework from the previous reporting period. We do also have the full reporting framework available on our website for you to access. So the, the first one that we'll look at is effective for the period 1 April 2022 to, uh, sorry, 2021 to 31 March 2022. Um, so maybe just to mention, Janine mentioned it's not only entities joining us today. If you do have a year in that's not 31 March and you're unsure how you fit into the reporting framework that is published, we do have an FAQ on that that will help you. Um, so the changes to this year's framework 21-22 uh, compared to the previous year is really very minimal. We have added Director 14 on the application of standards of GRAP by public entities that apply I4E standards. So this is applicable to entities that apply I4E standards by uh, way of Directive 12, which is the, the selection of an appropriate reporting framework by public entities. Um, so as you can imagine, I think it has very limited application. So for that reason, I do not have a specific slide on it, but I did think I could maybe just share some of the, um, the content from the Directive with you. If you are affected, then you can go and have a look. So the directive explains how these entities that apply the IFRS reporting framework develop accounting policies in the absence of an IFRS that specifically deal with a transaction or an event um, that is material to that entity. So this is now as part of the IFRS reporting framework. So they would develop an accounting policy that would form part of their IFRS reporting framework. Because these entities apply IFRS, the directive is um, looking from, for guidance uh, or it's built on the guidance in IS8 on accounting policies, changes in accounting estimates and errors. So in terms of that, um, entities must use judgment to determine their appropriate accounting policies and it's all based on the information that the users of those entities need. So with that in mind, you are going to look at an accounting policy that would provide reliable information. So all those things from the framework, it's faithfully represented. It's a substance of a form, which Janine will take you through in, in quite a bit of detail in the next topic. It's neutral, prudent, as well as complete. So those are all the things you need to think about when you develop accounting policies. Per IS8, there is a hierarchy of pronouncements that you consider when you develop an accounting policy in the absence of the, um, an IFRS that specifically deals with it. So firstly, you are going to look to similar IFRS standards that, or IFRS standards that deal with similar transactions or events. Um, it, if that is not helpful, you are going to look to the IFRS conceptual framework. 
So um, you can apply judgment and look to pronouncements of other standard sectors if neither of those two IFRS pronouncements um, are going to be helpful to you, as long as those pronouncements do not conflict with what the IFRS reporting framework says or other IFRS standards. So we've also added some guidance in the directive on when it would be inappropriate to develop accounting policies based on pronouncements of other standard setting bodies. Um, then I just also lastly, I think, want to mention that developing these accounting policies would not be applicable to presentation and disclosure. So we're talking about recognition and, and measurement, really. OK, so um, maybe at this stage, I just want to mention to my colleagues if they can assist me with uh, having a look at the chat function and just stop me if there are any questions. Um, the next slide that I have is on the next period reporting framework. And so this will be. 23. Um, it means that it starts 1 April 2022 until 31 March 2023. So you're probably now in the space of thinking about the previous one to, to get your financial statements prepared. Um, but you may want to start thinking about what's up for the next year so that you can start changing your systems and your policies if necessary. So this is the latest reporting framework that's available on our website. Um, I, I again want to mention that it's it's not big changes from the previous one, so probably not a big impact for you, although this pronouncement that we've issued, I think is quite important. So we have added IGRAP 21 on the effect of past decisions on materiality. So this is only effective 1 April 2023, but we do want to encourage entities to early adopt this uh, IGRAP. I'm not going to talk to you through detail um, on this one because we are going to look at this in in the coming uh, presentation. So as part of talking about the reporting framework, I do also have two slides that I just want to take you through on pronouncements of other standard setters that entities should not apply when they apply the GRAP reporting framework. So this actually applies to both the, the periods that we looked at now. So you may be aware that we set standards of GRAB based on IPSAS. So for that reason, we usually wait for the IPSAS B to complete their process of adapting IFRE standards for public sector before we would commence our projects locally. So entities locally should not refer to IFRE standards directly and apply these standards because we do have projects underway in the public sector to deal with these topics. So just taking you through the topics as on the slide, firstly, IFRS 13 on fair value measurement. You may be aware ED 77 of the IPSAS Beyond Measurement was issued last year. They, um, we also issued it concurrently locally for comment. They're busy working through the comment that they received back on this exposure draft at the moment, and we will wait for them to finalize their process. So we are looking at our work program for 24, 26 um, on that potentially. So Amanda will take you through through that as an exposure draft at the end of today's discussions. The other IFRS um, is IFRS 14 regulatory deferral account. So there's no IPSAS project on this, but we are following the ISB's project just to see what, what the movements are and whether there's anything that we need to do locally. Then revenue from contracts with customers, IFRS 15. This is uh, another big project of the IPSAS B that they are currently working on. We also issued this concurrently two years ago. Um, ED70 on revenue with performance obligations. They are similar to ED77 at the moment, working through the comments that they got, and we will wait for them to complete their process first. It does look like it is going to be re-exposed, and therefore we are probably looking at beyond 2026 for this um, locally as a project. Leases IFRS 16, the IPSAS B had ED 74 on leases. They actually just now, I think last week, published the final standard, um, which is a converged standard with IFRS 16. But they have two phases of this project, uh, the IPSAS B now. So the second phase they're only going to start with now to look at the public sector specific lease issues. 
So we will wait for them to complete the second phase of their project as well. We think that's um, that's really the important part to look at the public sector lease issues. I-47 on insurance contracts, um, the IPSSP does not have an equivalent standard, nor do we. I think it has really very limited application, but we are assessing the impact locally of the standard for those one or two entities that do apply I-47 or um, I-44 right now, but we'll move to I-47. So on the next slide, we now looked at I4E standards that entities should not apply. I mentioned that we follow IPSAS and we usually wait for them to finalize their projects before we start our project locally. So for similar reasons, entities should not apply the following IPSAS. Firstly, financial instruments. Um, so we have already amended GRAP 104 to be aligned to the latest international requirements. So we did look at what the IPSAS B did and what they had issued. Um, so we will look at the effective dates of some new pronouncements in a few slides, which uh, mentions this again. But I think just important to note that we are trying to provide entities with a lot of support in getting ready to apply the revised RAP 104. So if you have a look at our website, we have uh, fact sheets that were developed. We have FAQs and we also have a reference group where we work through all the topics um, and more on the practical side to try to to help entities implement this. On public sector combinations, we do have GRAP 105, 6 and 7 that deal with transfer of functions and mergers. So entities should apply our standards that are in effect right now. We do have an upcoming project to look at IPSAS 40 and how it may differ from what we have in 105 to 107. And then we'll decide if we need to make any changes to our standards. On social benefits, this is a gap in our literature and it used to be in the IPSAS literature until very recently as well. Entities should retain the accounting policies that they have prepared in the past and um, we did not support the general approach that is in IPSAS 42 dealing with the recognition and measurement of social benefit liabilities and related expenses. Um, so we do not uh, want entities to apply IPSAS 42. We do have our local project to develop a standard of GRAP on social benefits that's already underway and we encourage entities that may be affected to take part in this project that we have. Then amendments to IPSAS 19 for collective and individual services is also part of the broader, broader non-exchange expense project um, which led to IPSAS 42 being published on social benefits. Again, entities should retain their current accounting policies on this. They are still busy with the last part of their transfer expense um, project, so we are going to wait for them to finish that before we look at providing guidance on these in-kind benefits locally. Then on to the effective dates of new standards that have been approved. So there are a number of changes to standards which are not yet effective that, um, that have been made available on our website. Apologies, I, I, see I skipped a slide. Let me just get back to the right one. Okay. So firstly, amendments to GRAP 1 on presentation of financial statements. So the effective date of these amendments are 1 April, or sorry, is 1 April 2023. Entities can early adopt the amendments. Um, just a little bit of a flavor what this is about is it does relate to materiality and disclosures and trying to do away with entities following a checklist, which is in GRAP 1, and rather um, apply what they think would be best for, for their users needs. Then the next pronouncement is improvements to standards of GRAP also effective 1 April 2023. Entities can early adopt this. So how the improvements work is we do make um, more minor amendments to a number of different standards at one one stage or through one exposure draft, which is the improvements. Entities can choose to early adopt these amendments per standard, so you don't um, need to necessarily apply it early for all of them. 
Then we have GRAP 104 on financial instruments that we spoke about already. The minister had um, determined an effective date of 1 April 2025 for this pronouncement. Entities cannot early adopt this piecemeal, so you cannot decide for your receivables you are going to early adopt, but not for your payables, um, as an example. You do need to early adopt the entire standard if you choose to do so. But I, I think just want to mention to bear in mind all the other um, support initiatives that are going on in the environment to help entities get ready that that has been planned according to the 1 April 2025 effective date to make sure we we try to support entities in all the topics by then. Another standard that we have amended is GRAB 25 on employee benefits. We have proposed 1 April 2023 as the effective date to the Minister of Finance. It has not yet been approved, um, so entities cannot um, early adopt the standard. You, you could have theoretically developed an accounting policy based on this, but similar to GRAB 104, we are not um, allowing entities to do that you will see it's also not in in directive five so it's either you are going to adopt the whole standard and apply it in its entirety or you are not going to and you're going to wait for the effective date i just want to mention that igrap 7 has been amended as well with grab 25 the two of two go sort of hand in hand um, the effective date will be the same as GRAB 25, so we are just waiting for the Minister of Finance on that last, last one. Just very lastly, we do have some other documents that are also newly published on our website that I would like to make you aware of. I think they are good resources to support you in, um, in applying the standards. So we did do a review of the application of Directive 12 on um, and that is for public entities to determine their reporting framework. As a result of that, there is a review report that has been published on our website. Um, and with that, we have also developed a fact sheet on Directive 12. So both of those you can find on our website. The fact sheet is published with Directive 12. So it does not have an effective date. It's merely a communication, um, the review report, and then the fact sheet uh, support for you to apply the directive should it be applicable to you. Then we have done a review of how entities apply GRAP2 on cash flow statements. As an, an outcome of that review, we have published a research paper detailing all our findings and recommendations to entities to improve the application of GRAP2. Um, again, this does not have an effective date. It's not authoritative, but we do encourage entities to have a look at it. Um, I think there were some good findings and, and recommendations that came from that review. Then the exposure drafts that are available for comment on our website. Um, I'm not going to go through this in too much detail. I think Amanda will take you through that later on. So we have ED194 on our work program for 2024 to 2026. The consultation is in process. The deadline is 20, sorry, 18 March 2022. Um, another exposure draft that had recently closed is we are proposing amendments to GRAP 103 on heritage assets. This is as an outcome of a post-implementation review that we did and the, the comment closed just um, I think about last week, 28 January. There's another exposure draft that we've recently published, which is not on the slide, ED196. This is a proposed due process handbook with a comment deadline of 31 March 2022. Um, so if you are interested in the process that we follow to set the standards of GRAB, um, this is the document that you can have a look at and provide us with your comment. So with that, I'm going to uh, hand over to my colleague Janine. Let me just make sure that there aren't any questions that you've asked. Um, OK, no, I didn't see any. So I'm going to hand over to Janine for the next session. Thank you very much, Elisna, for that. Um, if you do have any questions that you think of during the session um, related to anything that we've said, please feel free to, to post the questions. Um, I totally forgot to introduce myself in the whole process. Um, I was quite nervous about getting all the IT working this morning, so I, I think I completely missed that. But as Elisna said, I'm Janine Pocellini. Um, I'm a technical director at the ASB. Um, 
Thank you again for joining the session. We will be making the slides available on the website. I hope to have them up this morning and then I can give you um, the link um, as we go along. Otherwise, we'll just circulate it to you afterwards. Um, but let me start with my my part of the presentation. So I think firstly, why are we talking about economic substance over legal form? Some of you might think, oh, this is quite obvious. Some of you might not know what we are talking about. Some of you might be wondering why we are talking about this now. And really what we have um, heard from some of our stakeholders during the last audit cycle is really that there are a number of issues emerging in, in practice about how to apply substance over form or that substance over form is not being applied. Um, so as a substance over form is really critical to preparing the financial statements, it's important that we have a conversation about it, specifically what it means, obviously, um, why it's important as well as its application. So to understand what applying substance over form means, going back to the basics of financial reporting and why we prepare financial statements, for who we prepare the financial statements and really what those users want to get out of the financial statements and, and what types of information they would like to receive. Because the objective of financial reporting is to provide users of financial statements with information to hold entities accountable and to make financial decisions, obviously it's very clear that it's financial and economic information that they are interested in. Um, if we think about the users and the types of decisions that they would want to make, I think in terms of the user group that we are talking about, we are talking about users as, as a very broad group. Um, so the financial statements should cover a wide variety of users' needs. And we really have two categories of users. The one is those that provide resources to an entity. And this could be taxpayers, ratepayers, lenders, financiers, creditors, employees. It's really a very wide group. And then we also have a look at users in terms of those that benefit or rely on government services. And obviously it's, it's I think, clear that some, the, some users that provide resources are not necessarily the ones that are going to directly benefit all the time and specifically the ones that are reliant on government services might might not contribute any resources at all. So it is really a very diverse group of people that we are looking at, but I think what's very important is that they need information about economic or other phenomena. So to provide information about economic and other decisions, um, the information in the financial statements needs to provide information on economic and other phenomena. And what this really means is that when we talk about economic phenomena, it's about resources and obligations that will change, i.e. increase or decrease the economic benefits or service potential for the entity. For that information in the financial statements to um, meet certain characteristics and to provide information about economic and other phenomena, um, it, it, sort of the criteria that it needs to meet, it needs to be relevant, which obviously relevant to the specific users as well as the decisions that they want to make. It should be a faithful representation of economic or other phenomena in the financial statements. It should be timely, so the information in the financial statements should obviously be received or published uh, to users such that they are able to make decisions to sort of take corrective action or make the decisions that they want to do on a timely basis. The information should be verifiable. Um, verifiable is not auditable. Um, verifiable means that if I have to put all of the assumptions and information that I use to get to sort of a specific measurement basis or something like that in the financial statements, um, a user would be able to sort of recreate that um, sort of calculation or measurement basis or whatever it is, um, such that they would be able to verify whether or not that is, is correct. The information should be comparable. Comparable does not mean consistent. Comparable means that you are able to identify similarities or differences between information, and obviously the information should be understandable. So what I've really described here is the qualitative characteristics that we talk about in the conceptual framework. What we are really focusing on when we are talking about substance over form is faithful representation, because what we are talking about for the most part is the faithful representation of economic or other phenomena. 
When we talk about faithful representation, um, there are three aspects to it. It should be complete. The information should be neutral and it should be free from error. So I think complete is easy to understand. Neutral means it needs to be free from bias. So you're not putting forward a positive or a negative view. It is completely neutral and it's free from error, which I think is, is also easy to understand. But very broadly, apart from those other three characteristics that make up faithful representation, faithful representation means that the information in the financial statements appropriately reflects the economic or other phenomena underlying the transactions. If you think about when you prepare your financial statements in your accounting policies, you would indicate your compliance with standards of GRAF. You wouldn't include a list of laws and regulations and contracts that you've signed and so on. And this is really a fundamental point, is that if you prepare your financial statements using standards of graph, you use the principles in the standards of graph to prepare your financial statements and not a legal framework. Um, importantly, if you do need to comply with certain aspects of legislation in preparing your financial statements and they are in conflict with standards of graph, obviously you would need to assess what impact that non-compliance has and if it's significant and material, you would obviously not be able to complain, not be able to assert compliance with standards of graph. So it is it is really quite important that you always have in the front of your mind when you prepare your financial statements that you are using the standards of graph to do so and not a legal framework. Um, this is just really emphasizing again that when we prepare the financial statements, we are focusing on the economic substance. We want to represent the economic phenomena of transactions and events and not their legal form or, or, or other sort of legal information about certain aspects. So if we are talking specifically about substance over form, I thought I would give you a couple of examples just to explain really what it is that we are mean, what what we mean, because I think I've given you the sort of theoretical conceptual arguments around it. And applying substance over form is really pervasive across the standards, and there are, are a number of instances and a number of examples where we apply substance over legal form. So I've given you a couple of examples here on the slides. There are obviously many, many, many more. Um, and obviously you would need to think about this whenever you prepare your financial statements, but these are just sort of to give you a flavor of what it is that we are talking about. So firstly, on an asset side, obviously you know that we account for assets that we control. And when we talk about control, we talk about control of economic benefits and service potential. It's not merely legal title or ownership. So if you think about land or buildings or leases of assets, it's really that you have a specific right that gives you the control of, of specific economic benefits and service potential. And depending on the nature of, of the rights and obligations that you have and the period over which you have them, um, you may be able to assert that you, for the most part, control an asset for its um, economic life and, and you recognize it then on your financial statements, even if legal title belongs to someone else. In terms of equity and liabilities, I, I thought I would put these two examples on because I know that we don't come across these things very often, but they are both really good examples of, of applying substance over form. So the first one, puttable instruments, I know that this is a lot of financial instrument jargon, but quite simply what this means is I issue an equity instrument as an entity uh, to a, a third party. If that third party is able to enforce that I buy back that share whenever they want uh, it bought back, then obviously I have an ongoing obligation to, to return their money to them, which means that although it is an equity instrument, it's a share instrument, actually I have a liability to buy back that instrument sort of on demand, which means that I would actually have a liability in that instance rather than equity. In the second example of preference shares, um, don't see these very often, but if you do issue preference shares, you would know that you are required to pay a, a guaranteed dividend throughout the, the, the time that that share is an issue. And obviously, if you are required to pay that dividend, you would actually have a component of the share that is equity, but you would have a component of the share that is also a liability. So that's an example of something that is 
is labeled as an equity instrument, but actually it does have a liability component from a, an accounting perspective. On the liability side, um, I thought I would just give you this example to say that, you know, what we see quite often in group entities is that advances are made to subsidiaries. Um, it's often called something like an inter-entity inter loan account or just a loan to a subsidiary. Sometimes th these amounts of monies are not repayable. Um, so there's a difference between when you do advance the money and it is very clearly repayable, but you just don't know when. Um, some of these arrangements don't have any repayment um, requirements at all. And in those instances, potentially there aren't a liability for the entity. It could just be that those are, are equity um, or revenue that you have received. And likewise, on the um, parent that's advancing the money, it could just be an expense rather than a, an investment. Oh, apologies. <laughs> um, the next one that I want to go through is classification of arrangements. So quite often in, in contracts or in legislation, you may find certain, um, I want to say relationships being identified or arrangements being classified and labeled. Um, and I think what I want to say here is that it's quite important that although something is labeled something in law or a contract doesn't necessarily mean it's going to have exactly the same identification when you have a look at the principles and the standards of graph. So I think the two most common examples that I could think of when I was putting this together is principal agent arrangements. I think this is um, sort of front of mind at the moment, particularly given the court case in the Western Cape um, around sort of the classification of expenditure between principals and agents under the modified cash environment. Um, just because a contract says that there is a principal agent arrangement doesn't mean that there is from an accounting perspective. You would still need to have a look at, at GRAP 109. Um, Obviously, the principles that we have explained in the definition of principal agent arrangements in GRAP 109 is consistent with the idea in law, um, common law principal agent arrangements. But obviously, you would still need to assess whether or not it is for accounting purposes. And the other thing that we see is that quite often in the arrangements, who's the principal and who's the agent are, are clearly defined in the contract. Um, you would know that we have specific criteria actually in GRAP 109 to identify who's the principal and who's the agent. So just because they are labeled as such in a contract doesn't mean that they are that for accounting purposes. You would still need to assess the criteria. The other one that we see quite often is control relationships. So typically a, a contract or a, a piece of law could say that one entity controls another or has a majority share or majority votes or whatever it is and therefore controls. So you would know from an accounting perspective, we assess control differently. Um, for a group perspective, you need to be able to control and benefit from that particular relationship. It's not necessarily just based on votes and shareholding. So you would also need to assess the various criteria from an accounting perspective. So I think, uh, you know, this is just really a flavor. I think we could go on and on and talk about various examples of substance over form, but it's just to give you an idea of the kinds of things that you should be looking at when you do have a look at preparing your financial statements. So what are we doing in practice? Um, and I think as I started off the session, I said towards the end of last year, we had some stakeholders raise some concerns with us about the non-application of substance over form or that, um, maybe it wasn't being applied as well as it should be. And I think um, what we have, have seen for the most part is that preparers are not always applying substance over form. Um, and I guess why not is the thing that we need to answer. And there's a couple of reasons why um, I think there could be more. But I think the ones that we are, are most aware of is, is firstly knowledge of the concept. So I think we are trying to really raise awareness about substance over form, where it comes from, why it's in the standards, um, the, the kinds of areas where it should be applied, and, and obviously just really trying to re-explain this idea to, to prepare so that they are clear about this. The second aspect is that obviously if you if you need to apply substance over form, you need to apply judgment. So you, you are really making a judgment call that that deviates from a legal perspective of, let's say, ownership and saying, well, OK, I do think that actually the rights, um, for example, of an asset substantively have been given to somebody else because of a number of factors. And therefore, I conclude that I should recognize this asset, despite the fact that legal ownership is, is based somewhere else. 
making those kinds of assessments is difficult. Um, we know judgment is difficult, but I, I think um, just because something is difficult doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. I think what you should do is really think about how you are applying those criteria, document them, make it very clear in your financial statements how you arrived at, at these specific um, conclusions so that users are aware in the financial statements. Um, the third thing that we have um, been alerted to is really that there's this idea that legislation or contracts, or I'll put it really broadly, the legal framework, needs to be the same as the accounting outcome, um, and that's not, not the case. Um, so it is fine, for example, if legislation says that one entity controls another, and for accounting purposes, we don't consolidate the entity as an example, um, just because obviously we would use specific criteria to assess control differently to the way that, that the legal principles would have a look at it. So really there's no need for you to, to be concerned if there is a difference between law and accounting. I think because we do look at economic phenomena, there is a, a, a good chance that there would be a difference. Um, you, you also don't need to go and change contracts, for example, if you are seeing that the accounting outcome is different it's okay, you know, the accounting framework it is, is designed to be something different. Um, the other thing that we are aware of is the court ruling. I did speak very broadly about that. Um, I'm sure most of you would be aware about that um, Western Cape ruling about the, it was the Department of Economic Opportunities, I think, um, and it had to do with the classification of expenditure in the financial statements. Um, they did obviously get a legal view about the classification in terms of the modified cash standard, as well as the existence of principal agent arrangements. I think the one thing that I want to make very clear is I don't think going to court to interpret accounting is really a good idea. I think lawyers are, are very clear about their sort of legal principles and how to interpret them. But interpreting standards is, is different. You would know that you went through sort of seven years of studying yourselves if, if you're a, a professional accountant um, and have a very long sort of career of interpreting accounting. I think that can't just simply be replaced um, if you are going to court. So um, I think don't let these court rulings that you hear of influence your decisions. You still need to apply the principles and the standards of GRAP when you prepare your financial statements. We don't. Uh, use legal principles only when we prepare financial statements, we need to use GRAP. So I think in terms of the way forward, we um, are going to sort of be on a drive, which is why we are talking to you about this today over the next couple of months to really raise awareness about the issue of applying substance over form. You will see some information in our newsletter as well as in our social media platforms, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter and Facebook. So would urge you to keep an eye on these various things um, where we do talk about substance over form and, and really what we mean when we talk about this. The other thing is really just an ask to you is to be mindful when you prepare your financial statements that you, you are thinking about substance over form and how this affects your financial statements. I'm going to pause there and just see if there are any questions before I move on to the next issue. Uh, okay, there's a question. Okay, thank you, listener, for responding. I don't think that is necessarily a principal agent issue. Um, I think for those of you that may have joined, you won't be able to ask questions if um, through putting on your microphone. So if you do have a question, um, please just post it in the chat function so that we can respond to it. Um, we are a very group, big group of people today. You'll see there's almost 400 of us, so we can't we can't have everybody's microphones and cameras on. So if you do have a question, please post it in the chat. Uh, sorry, let me just go to the first question, which is from Zizel. If an entity acquires properties, one of which is an open road, although the title is in the entity's name, control does not really vest with the entity as it has no rights to grant or restrict access. Is it accurate to not recognize this property in the entity's financial statements? 
Um, so I think what you would need to have a look at is we do have um, IGRAP um, 18 on the recognition and de-recognition of land. Um, so if we are talking about land specifically, obviously the one thing that you would need to think about is the time. Um, if, if you have assets that um, have a, a, a finite life, it's probably a bit easier to make the assessment. But with land, you would really need to think about whether or not you are able to restrict or deny access, um, given that land sort of has an unlimited time, um, and, and really think about it in that context. So I, I I note the, the context and the question that you have. I think have a look at IGRAP 18. It does try and answer the question really about, um, of course, if we talk about land, it is possible that you do recognize the land or not recognize the land based on if you've either have rights or have given away rights to land. But I think what's important is to have a look at the period over which um, those kinds of, of um, arrangements exist. Just want to see, I think there was another question. Riaz. If an entity simply buys assets, e.g. computer for another entity to use, in substance, is it fair to say that the assets should not be on purchases books? Yeah, I mean, I, I think if you are buying assets for another entity and you are not going to use those assets at all, so it's sort of a, um, I want to say a donation or a gift of those assets to the other entity, um, you're never going to benefit from their use. I think that um, is, is, exam is a very good example um, of, of applying substance over form. Even though you bought it, you may have, in theory, the legal title to it. But if you are giving it to another entity to utilize, it is a non-exchange transaction, probably where you've actually transferred this asset in, in, in substance to, to another party. So thank you for that. Um, Rio Malusi, I see you do have your hand up. Unfortunately, we're not able to accommodate questions verbally. If you could type your question in the chat box, that would be appreciated. Um, again, just to say we are a very group, big group of people, so to, to sort of keep the meeting as efficient as possible, your microphones and your cameras have been disabled, um, but please feel free to type questions in the chat function. Are there any other questions that anyone might have on, on substance over form? If you do have any, please feel free to, to post them as we go along. I know it's quite difficult sometimes to type and listen, so please feel free to, to carry on typing as, as we move into the next session. So what I would like to talk to you about is um, in our next section, is the effect of past decisions on materiality. So a listener would have spoke to you about um, the IGRAP, IGRAP 21 that was issued by the board, uh, as well as its effective date. And I thought I would just take you through this. Um, it doesn't feel all that long ago that we were actually doing the consultation on IGRAP 21. Um, so some of you may have seen this presentation before. Um, it, it's, it's largely unchanged. But I think it's still a really good um, summary of, of the interpretation and what really we were trying to do and where we landed with this. So I think um, just as some background, when we issued the guideline on the application of materiality to financial statements in 2018, a number of respondents had really commented to us to say, well, it isn't all that clear about if I've applied um, materiality historically, um, what the effect would be going forward. So, for example, and, and I'll, I'll circle back to this example a few times. It's not the only example, but I think it's the one that's um, most prominent in people's minds is, you know, if I make a decision to expense um, assets in, in a particular reporting period, low value assets, um, do I need to really keep record of those things over time to assess if the non-capitalization, to use that phrase, um, becomes material over time, you know, because, for example, I, I now have maybe, you know, a hundred of the same thing. Um, is it going to affect my materiality in subsequent reporting periods? And I think that we we didn't specifically have a view at that stage and at that point in time when we developed the guideline. I think we were sort of almost between our stakeholders as well as the board sort of um, split down the middle pretty equally about whether or not materiality 
um, could become an issue in subsequent reporting peri periods. And we felt that we needed to, to do a separate piece of work to really um, provide guidance on this particular issue. So we, the board agreed that we should undertake a review of GRAP3. Obviously, you would know that GRAP3 is really the standard where all of the trouble starts in terms of applying materiality, because it says that if um, the effects of applying specific principles in the standards of GRAP are not material, you need not apply the principles in the standards. So as a result, we, we agreed that we would have a look at GRAP3 and, and see if there was any guidance needed. I think very clearly, just given the diversity of views, um, both amongst, as I said, preparers, auditors, and even our board, we had really said, OK, I think this is, is really an area where we need to issue an interpretation. So in terms of the problem statement that we started off trying to resolve initially was to say, well, OK, Graph 3 on accounting policies, changes in accounting estimates and errors is used to develop accounting policies. It does say that the accounting policies and the standards of GRAP should be applied except when the effect of applying them is immaterial. So if we're talking about accounting policies, we are really talking about the principles and the standards for recognition, measurement, presentation and disclosure. So you should, when you formulate your accounting policies, whether it's for recognition, measurement, presentation, and then deciding what disclosure you should provide, um, you should apply the standards except if the effect of applying them is immaterial. So, so what does this mean? Um, this really means that entities can apply alternative accounting treatments for the recognition and measurement of items. It does also mean that entities need not present and disclose certain information in a certain way, but I think for today's section, today's session, we are really focusing on recognition and measurement. So some typical examples of what we are talking about. Um, and obviously not, uh, 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 these are just purely examples that we had found in practice. Um, I know some of them are a little controversial, but I do think that they have merit because this is really what entities have been applying in practice. So the first one is expensing immaterial items that meet the definition of an asset. So I think the most common example is expensing low value assets that meet the definition of PP and E. Typically things like office furniture, um, you know, desks, chairs, maybe some computer equipment, um, those sorts of things potentially are expensed just because their value is low. Um, and the question really becomes, so, you know, should I really assess now over time what the effect of, of those decisions are? Um, the other one that we've seen where entities have alternative accounting treatments is related to transaction costs particularly for financial instruments. It could be the same for purchases of, of, of PP and E or, or other assets that you acquire. But I think where we see this most commonly is financial instruments, just because we don't really have very large transaction costs for the types of things that we buy. So quite often we see that, you know, particularly if you have transact, sorry, financial instruments that are measured at amortized cost, you should actually be including the transaction costs in your initial amount. Um, that you recognize, but because they are immaterial, they quite often get expensed. The other area where we see um, a, a potential difference related to, um, and this has got to do with the classification of assets, is really where, for example, an entity may have immaterial heritage assets that they decide that they are going to account for as property, plants and equipment, rather than applying GRAP 103. Um, and obviously this is really because you, you may only have a few heritage assets with a very low value. So in that instance, um, you know, there isn't really merit in, in you applying the full graph 103. You could potentially just account for those assets as property, plants and equipment. The other area that we sometimes see is the purchase of servitudes. Um, sometimes depending on the value, again, they could meet the definition of an intangible asset depending on how they are purchased. Um, so potentially if they are immaterial for, for various reasons, rather than applying the intangible asset standard, it might just be more appropriate to capitalize them as part of property, plant and equipment. So these are just some examples of alternative accounting treatments based on you know, the materiality of items. I'm not saying that these are all correct in all instances. They were certainly just examples that we had identified in practice. 
So in terms of the problem statement that we were trying to, to resolve is that when entities had applied these alternative accounting treatments, what we saw is that they were often required to keep record of all of these transactions. So let's say if you expensed assets, you had to keep a list of all of the assets that you had expensed, when you had bought them, what their potential depreciation would have been, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because there was this view um, that was sort of in place saying, well, you needed to assess what the effect of that would be over time. And remember, you don't just assess the depreciation line, you would assess, um, you know, other aspects in the notes to the financial statements. And that was quite often where, you know, it was deemed to be material over time. So there was this view that you had to keep these records. But the other sort of accounting consequence was really that if you, um, if something did become material over time, then you would need to really make a retrospective adjustment. And because it was a retrospective adjustment, quite often it was treated as, as an error in the financial statements. So this leads us to the principles in graph 21, in iGraph 21, um, which is called the effect of past decisions on materiality. And it deals solely with the application of materiality for recognition and measurement. Um, any sort of materiality and how it's applied to presentation and disclosure is dealt with in graph one. Um, so again, just to be clear, we're only talking about recognition and measurement today in iGraph 21. If you do have issues related to materiality in disclosure and presentation, you need to have a look to graph one for that. So the two answers or two issues that we are dealing with in terms of, of iGraph 21 is, is do, do decisions that I make about materiality today affect future reporting periods in any way? And the second issue is that if I do apply an alternative accounting treatment, and when I talk about an alternative accounting treatment, it's really um, an accounting treatment that is not consistent with GRAP or is not developed using standards of GRAP, particularly for a particular transaction or event. So you've come up with your own accounting treatment for these particular items. And what we are really trying to, to discuss is whether or not this is an error or a departure from the standards of GRAP. So on the first issue, do past decisions about materiality affect future reporting periods? You would know that materiality is assessed um, at a particular point in time. And um, I think the thing that's important to note is that materiality is sort of an ongoing assessment that you would make. Um, it's based on all relevant facts and circumstances that exist at a particular point in time. So it could be that you are assessing materiality during the reporting period, but obviously you would need to assess at reporting date again what your materiality is and whether or not that idea and that view is still consistent with your overall assessment of materiality um, during the reporting period. So decisions about materiality are obviously based on the facts and circumstances that you have available to you when you make that assessment. Um, so they are period specific, they are time specific. So as a result of that, there is no effect that your current decisions based on your current views, current information can have on future reporting periods. I think what's important is that you would obviously, when you talk about making your materiality assessments, it needs to be informed about all information that you have, including what the potential effect could be on the future when you set your um, materiality thresholds today. But obviously, if you make a correct assessment of materiality today, um, you know, there's simply no way that that assessment will impact future reporting periods. So if you make a decision today, for example, that these kinds of assets are immaterial to your business, then obviously, and you expense them, then, then that's a, a period specific assessment that you make and it won't have an effect on future reporting periods. To understand the, the question that was raised in terms of whether or not alternative accounting treatments are sort of a departure from GRAP, um, whether it's a change in accounting policy, I think to be clear, retrospective changes to financial statements can only be made when there is a change in accounting policy or when an error was made. So changing from an accounting treatment to a graph accounting policy is not a change in policy. For it to be a change in accounting policy, it must be moving from one graph accounting policy to another graph accounting policy. If you are sort of applying an alternative accounting treatment to something that was immaterial, in theory, you're not applying the standards of graph at that moment in time. 
time, um, you're obviously doing what's allowed in terms of the standards, but your accounting policy is not based on graph. Um, if you have something that's immaterial and you move to a new graph accounting policy, um, I use new in inverted commas, then that is not a change in accounting policy. So as a result, having these alternative accounting treatments, moving to, you know, if you have to capitalize, you know, assets at a subsequent reporting date, that's uh, obviously not a change in accounting policy, nor is it an error. Um, so very clearly that um, if you do have changes in materiality such that you need to move from an alternative accounting treatment to an accounting policy based on GRAP, um, that obviously is not a change in accounting policy. It's not an error. Um, I think we've very clearly identified from GRAP 3 um, in these situations that the only time that you would have a retrospective change is really if you made an error in how you assessed materiality. But the actual change from one policy to another is not an error. It's not a change in policy. The only time that you would have any retrospective change is really if you made an error in, in deciding on what your materiality should be. So I, I think it should be quite obvious by now that when you prepare your financial statements, you could have um, two, two sort of types of, of, of policies broadly or accounting treatments. You could have alternative accounting treatments, which would apply to immaterial items. Um, these alternative accounting treatments are sort of broadly developed using the, you know, other principles in the standards of GRAP or the conceptual framework, but you don't have to apply the specific principles to that specific transaction um, relevant to a specific standard of graph. You would then also have accounting policies. Um, so this is where you would base them specifically on the principles in the standards of graph for that particular transaction or event. And this would really be for, for the material items in your financial statements. So I think in terms of developing your accounting treatments and accounting policies, um, obviously it would be based on materiality that you assess during the reporting period as well as at reporting date. I think we are trying to emphasize both of these things because I think what happens quite often is that entities could potentially assess a materiality level at a point in time, but what they don't do is sort of go back and revisit that um, as sort of time changes during the reporting period. Um, so you do constantly need to assess your materiality throughout the reporting period and at reporting date to ensure that it is appropriate. What's important is that you need to use all relevant facts and circumstances at, at the date that you are assessing materiality. Um, so that means either during the reporting period or at reporting date. You need to apply materiality consistently to similar items, transactions or events. Um, what this, I think, is, is really trying to, to explain is that apart from obviously assessing materiality for things that are similar and are the same, it also means that um, you can have different materiality levels for different transactions and events. So, you know, for example, I can have different materiality levels potentially for different classes of, of assets, depending on materiality being defined based on both qualitative and quantitative criteria. So I think what generally happens is that entities would set one materiality level and try and apply it to all items in the financial statements, when in fact it could be that you could have different materiality levels for different things. Um, and obviously what's important is to just to make sure that you apply the right materiality to the, the items that are, are similar um, for based on whatever criteria you've established for yourself. Sorry, I went too quickly. Um, in terms of a, a couple of other things to consider in terms of offsetting your materiality thresholds. So apart from using all information available at a specific point in time and obviously identifying different materiality levels for different things, you would also need to consider materiality both quantitatively and qualitatively. So quantitatively is, is obviously the RAND value. Qualitatively is looking at the nature of specific items and saying, well, some items could have a lower um, qualitative materiality because of, of their nature. Um, you know, so, so something that I, I know is quite controversial is some people would say, well, probably there would be a different materiality, for example, for heritage assets, just because they have a very high qualitative materiality um, 
a very high quality factor just because of the nature of the items that they are and obviously that um, uh, you would probably want to see more of those things in their financial statements because of the qualitative characteristics, um, you know, ver versus just normal items of PP and E. The other thing that um, you would need to do in setting your materiality is consider the effect of individual items as well as what their collective effect could be. So if I, I take the example of a chair, if I buy, you know, sort of a, a plastic chair that I'm going to put in a hall somewhere, it is not individually a material, but potentially if I'm buying 10,000 of them, it, it might become collectively uh, material. But of course, I don't only just have a look at the number and the quantity and the rand value. I would also have a look at the qualitative factors and say, well, you know, sort of how important is it for users to know about this? The last thing which is very important, and, and I don't think this is something that entities have been doing, is that really if I do assess materiality, I need to assess what I know. I need to assess materiality based on what I know now, but also what I expect to happen in the future. So, for example, if I build a stadium um, and I know I need to still put in all the chairs, if I buy, if, let's say I need to put in 60,000 chairs, maybe I buy 5,000 of the chairs this year, so that might not be material, but if I know that I'm still going to have to buy 55,000 chairs next year, um, obviously I would, I would assess that when I set my materiality level for the chairs this year. I can't just have a look at what's happening this year. I need to have a look at what I know about the future in setting today's materiality. And I mean, we're not asking that you make complex assessments of what's happening in the future. I think what we are simply saying is have a look at your budget, have a look at your strategy, have a look at all of those kinds of information to be able to say, um, is there something that I know about the future that I should consider when I set materiality today, such that you know I, I am considering all the available information today when I set those those materiality levels. So I'm going to run through some examples. Um, I'm going to do two now and two later. They are sort of linked to one another. But I think let's start firstly with example one. Um, and, and it is a municipal example, but I mean, you can replace municipality A with public entity A. Um, and the example is that the entity applies materiality to decide which items of computer equipment should be recognized as assets in accordance with GRAP 17. Computer equipment in this instance comprises computer peripherals like printers and screens and keyboards and high value computer equipment such as tablets, laptops and servers. So quite clearly we're making a distinction already between um, certain peripherals as well as sort of high value items that that um, you know are tablets, laptops and servers. So already making a distinction between the same kind of asset, but obviously different characteristics for those. In this example, um, the computer equipment is mainly used for administrative purposes. So the municipality considers the nature and value of the computer equipment both individually and collectively in determining materiality. The, the municipality determines that the effect of not capitalizing computer peripherals in accordance with GRAP 17, even if considered collectively, is likely to have an immaterial effect on the financial statements both now and in the future. So what we are saying with the computer peripherals, which is the printers and the screens and the keyboards and all of those small things that, well, look, I may have a number of those things now. I'm potentially going to have uh, a number of those things into future, but really they are not material for, for my business, both quantitatively or qualitatively, both now and, and going forward. So based on this assessment, the municipality would develop criteria uh, about distinguishing when something is a computer peripheral based on the nature of the item and also using some sort of a qualitative threshold that they would implement. So the quantitative materiality that they have considered is uh, something that has an individual cost of 5,000 Rand or less, is immaterial and it will be expensed, assuming that it also meets this um, sort of qualitative criteria of being a computer peripheral and however that is defined. So the alternative accounting treatment here would be anything less than 5,000 Rand and meets the definition of a computer peripheral would, would not be capitalized in accordance with GRAP 17 and would be expensed. Anything above 5,000 Rand or that is not a computer peripheral would then be capitalized in terms of, of GRAP 17. So in terms of this scenario, the municipality acquires a range of similar items that are classified as computer equipment. Um, so again, there's an overall um, sort of label of items called computer equipment 
but within that there could be different uh, items with different characteristics um, depending on qualitative and quantitative materiality which would drive your separate accounting treatment. This could really result in individual items of computer equipment with a value of less than 5,000 Rand being expensed and individual items of computer equipment with a value of more than 5,000 Rand and not being computer peripherals then being capitalized. The alternative accounting treatment or accounting policy is applied consistently to all similar items in the same category. Um, so again, you need to be clear about if you have materiality thresholds and criteria, you need to apply them consistently to all the items that you acquire um, in terms of the materiality that you have set. The accounting will, however, depend on the materiality of each individual item. So in this instance, the municipality would have both an accounting policy and an alternative accounting treatments and, and apply both of these based on materiality. And this would be applicable both in current and subsequent reporting periods. Um, so again, you would carry on with this accounting policy unless, of course, circumstances change sub, sub, such that you would need to revise your accounting, um, sorry, your materiality thresholds either upwards or downwards, depending on, on specific um, circumstances. Um, I think importantly that you would need to determine the threshold at a low enough level to ensure that the effect of cumulative expensing of individual items in the current and future reporting periods would not have a material effect on the financial statements, either in part or, or when taken as a whole. In example two, um, I've taken an example of a college. So many of the TVET and CET colleges are now applying standards of GRAP, and there are other entities that might be in a similar situation, just extending the example of computer equipment, but with a, di a different context. In this instance, saying that College A develops a materiality threshold for the acquisition of computer equipment, and in this instance, computer equipment comprises computer peripherals, um, again, printer screens, keyboards, external cameras and microphones, and other computer equipment such as desktop computers, laptops, servers, um, 3D printers. Obviously, this is a college that mainly offers IT related qualifications, and most of the computer equipment acquired is used by students in its computer lab. So you can already see here that the nature of the items takes on a different flavor. So the qualitative materiality is also going to be different in the scenario because the computer equipment is really used in service delivery. So given the volume and the use of the computer equipment by students, the computer equipment is an integral part of the college's infrastructure and service delivery. The college determines that while the value of individual items of computer equipment, including some of the peripherals, are sort of immaterial, um, so the collective or the aggregate value of all computer equipment is material. Um, as a result, the college decides that all computer equipment should be recognized in accordance with GRAP 17 because of its collective materiality. So if you have a look um, in this example, as much as we are saying that some of the individual items are immaterial, if I aggregate everything together, whether it's a computer peripheral or some of the, the more expensive um, high value computer equipment, um, obviously all of it is going to be material just collectively. And I think apart from that, because the computer equipment is really integral to the college's infrastructure, then they would be in a situation that they have decided then to capitalize all, all computer equipment. So I think if you draw a, a sort of comparison between the two, in the first example, it was really the computer equipment was used for admin purposes. Um, you know, there, there were some smaller things that were, although they were being used by the entity, they were being used in, a, in an administrative capacity. Um, adding all the things together didn't have a cumulative effect um, and there were no sort of changes planned into the future. On the other side, on the college side, um, IT infrastructure is really just so critical to the um, service delivery of the college that it would make it qualitatively material but also because of the volume you would be you know buying a lot of computer um, equipment whether small things or big things or high value items that it would just make it um, sort of collectively material as well as qualitatively material before i go on to alternative accounting treatments or errors or departures i just want to pause and ask if there are any questions Uh, thank you, Sandy. So I just want to see if there's a question before yours. 
Mean the oh, quite a number of questions. Amanda and I have been uh, trying to respond to them, but maybe you can just have a look and see if there's anything you want to add. And I think we may have missed a few as well. OK, so I'm just going to answer if you if you don't mind answering some some of the substance over form ones and I'll deal with the materiality ones now. So an, a question from Nicoline, do you have support for the for the amount of 5000 that you decide on specifically from an audit perspective or will it be sufficient if you formulate a policy indicating the threshold? So remember, these are just examples that I'm taking you through. They don't um, they're not sort of a, a norm that we use across the sector. You would need to decide individually in your organization what you think the amount is. Um, I don't think you can apply 5000 Rand universally. Um, I take the ASB, our budget is sort of 15 million Rand, 5,000 Rand is a lot of money for us, but 5,000 Rand is nothing for a metro, for example. So you would really need to, um, if you develop your um, qualitative and quantitative um, qualitative criteria, quantitative thresholds, have a look at a number of different aspects when you do that. I think what's important is that you document um, your considerations, take it to your audit committee, um, let the auditors obviously engage with that number as well as part of the audit committee and governance processes, um, and then obviously apply it in your financial statements. So it was just an example using 5,000 Rand. Um, OK, in terms of treating this prospectively, I will deal with that now, um, and I will give you some examples of why it is prospective only. Um, was there any consultation done. Thank you, Sandisa, for your question. Was there any specific consultation done with the auditors? Even though the Auditor General is an ex officio board member of the ASB, materiality guidelines by the board are often treated as not binding to public sector auditors. Was this addressed in the development or approval of IGRAP 21? So we did engage with auditors quite extensively. Um, it's something that we have on our um, I wouldn't say to do list for the year, but we will continue to hold sessions on materiality, both with preparers and auditors um, to explain what materiality means from an audit and from a uh, an accounting perspective. They are obviously the same idea, although how materiality is used could be slightly different because obviously the auditors would use it to design their audit procedures and then sort of give an opinion on um, whether or not there are material misstatements, whereas from our perspective, we would have a look at materiality to drive information being presented in the financial statements, the idea of materiality is consistently. Whether it's going to be exactly the same number or exactly the same criteria all the time is obviously something that, that the auditors and the preparers would need to find agreement on. But in short, yes, we, we did discuss this with, with the auditors. Um, we actually have had a session with the ARD unit as well at, at the Auditor General to go through this. I think the difficulty is, is that I think the, the technical people at, at the ARD um, unit of the AGSA obviously are familiar with how materiality is or isn't the same. I think it's just trying to spread the message more broadly to auditors, but it is something that we will have a look um, uh, at as part of our sort of activities for the year. Um, this is uh, OK. There was an example um, that uh, a change to an accounting policy. Used, sorry, let me start again. Fortunate from is asking, you say a change from an ac alternative accounting treatment to an accounting policy. Graf is not a change in accounting policy. Is an alternative accounting policy not seen as a policy? So changing from one policy to the other may be argued that it is a change in accounting policy. So the answer is no. Um, so an alternative accounting treatment is not actually based on the standards of GRAP. Um, you, you may want to leverage the principles in the standards of GRAP. You could be using the conceptual framework to drive your decisions, but it's not a GRAP accounting policy. So you're moving from something that's not GRAP to GRAP, um, which means that it's not a change in GRAP accounting policy. It's actually, you know, for lack of a better word, a GRAP accounting policy that you're applying for the first time. So we'll get to this in the second part of the presentation, but it is really a, seen as a, a sort of a first time adoption of that policy. You won't go back and change information retrospectively. Um, so no, it's not, it's not a change in a GRAP accounting policy. Um, it's actually sort of the first time adoption of a GRAP accounting policy to a particular item. 
Um, okay, IFRS equivalent for IGRAF 18, no. Thanks, thanks, Amanda, you've answered that. Um, no, not specifically. Um, okay, there's another question over substance over form. Um, thank you, ladies, for answering these questions. Um, uh, sorry. <laughs> As soon as I scroll down, then something else happens. Um, sorry. Um, instead of treating it as an error, is it treated as a change in estimate? We'll get to this in the second part of the presentation, so just hang on for that. Um, thank you, Sandiesel, for your response. Um, yes, I. I think the idea of, of dealing with disagreements between preparers and auditors um, is something that we have on our radar as well. Um, I, I think when we get an opportunity to speak to the Auditor General and the National Treasury about this, um, we will certainly raise it as an issue. Um, I think the substance over form issue as well as materiality have been causing some difficulties of late, so it's definitely something that we will pick up. Um, not just in the context of this, um, but obviously um, for a number of other disagreements that could arise. Um, okay, so in the from Vishal, um, in the past the AG has required us to amend the financial statements for invoices relating to services rendered in the prior year, but the actual invoice was received after the finalization of the previous year financials. The value was not material and we argued therefore does not require amendment, but they insisted and we had to include a prior year error. Will the interpretation address this? So yes, it will. Um, you would have to think about, um, of, of course, you know, when you prepare your financial statements, um, I, I think you do make estimates based on what you have and, and simply if there are things that you didn't include, you would need to assess if they are material or not. Um, apologies. Just just excuse me for a moment. Apologies for that. Um, the dog was barking, so I just wanted to get him to, to, to shush. <laughs> um, so I, I think in terms of, of items that were excluded from the financial statements and obviously assessing whether or not it is an error, you would of course need to think about materiality in that context. Um, I think the other thing that I just want to mention is that if you do have an error, you would still need to consider whether or not the material, the error itself is material and how you want to treat that. Um, so just because you have an error doesn't mean you automatically need to correct it. I think from an audit perspective, you would have your summary of unadjusted differences. That's obviously an audit issue, but from an accounting perspective, you would need to say, well, am I, is this something that I'm going to adjust for because it's material or not? Um, the other thing that we have seen just while I'm talking about corrections of errors is that we see that entities, if they do have errors that they correct, they are sometimes so minor and so immaterial, but there are pages and pages of disclosure in the financial statements about it. So I think even if you have an error, obviously it, you, 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 know, you would want to correct these things as much as possible, um, but obviously your treatment would still depend on um, your materiality for, for, for those specific things. So, um, okay, I'm not going to deal with that. I think Amanda has answered that. Um, okay, so, sorry, I just want to go. I think, Elisna, could you um, deal with the graph 104 and graph 25 issue, if you don't mind? Um, 
so if we are talking about Raquel, thank you for your question. Um, if we do have a re reported liability in one segment only as part of a segment reporting during the previous audited financials, and in the current year we want to split it between three segments, would this be seen as a prior period error or could we then apply an alternative accounting treatment and adopt accordingly? So I think if we are talking about recognition, we are talking about recognition and measurement today, I think for the presentation of your segment information, you would need to go back to graph one and have a look at what it says specifically about presentation and disclosure and, and how you would want to deal with that. Um, so again, one of the things that you would naturally need to think about is, um, you know, obviously graph one says that you need to prepare comparative amounts for, um, for, for all numbers and all items in your financial statements. But obviously if they are, are immaterial in the comparative reporting period, then obviously you wouldn't pr provide that information. So um, I think the answer for you would lie in graph one today. We're just talking about um, recognition and measurement. Um, OK, so I think that's it. I'm going to go back to the presentation and thank you for the questions so that I can um, just take you through the second part of the presentation, which is really going to then have a look at our alternative accounting treatments, errors or departures from the standards. So um, I, I think what's important to consider in this scenario is that um, graph three allows entities to not apply the standards of graph to immaterial items. So this really means that that graph three is giving you permission to not apply the principles of the standards to to recognition and measurement as well as presentation and disclosure um, if the effect is immaterial. So as a result, um, because graph three gives you permission, applying an alternative accounting treatment is not a departure from the standards of graph and it is not an error. So when can errors arise? And bearing in mind what we are talking about here is errors in the application of materiality. So we have identified in iGraph 21 that there are four instances when errors could arise. So the first one is that immaterial items are omitted from the financial statements. So this is something that, that entities frequently have an incorrect view on. Um, applying a, an alternative accounting treatment or applying materiality doesn't mean that I leave things out of the financial statements. It means that everything is in the financial statements, but how I am going to treat them is different. So if I have a hundred things um, and I, I think that some of them are immaterial, let's say 20 of them are immaterial, I'm still going to include all hundred things in my set of financial statements, but the way that I treat the 20 is going to be different, if that makes sense. So I'm not going to leave out the 20 just because they are immaterial. I'm just going to change how it is that they are, are recognized, measured, presented or disclosed. So I think that's very important to remember. The, the second issue is that um, you could have an error when you have inappropriate accounting treatment uh, that you have applied because of a failure to use or misuse reliable information that was available or could reasonably have been expected to be used. So if you think about, and we'll talk about an, an example now where you do need to think about your sort of future state of your entity. Um, I used my previous example at the stadium. If you know, for example, this year you've bought 5,000 chairs because you still need to put in all the chairs in the stadium and the total next year that you will buy is going to be 55,000 to make up the 60,000 in the example that I used. If, if you fail to consider materiality now, knowing that you are going to have 60,000 next year, um, obviously that would be information that you did not use appropriately in setting your accounting materiality. If you do have alternative accounting treatments, but you are setting them up such to achieve a particular presentation in the financial statements, obviously this is manipulation. This is not allowed. So, you know, let's say, for example, um, you have a balance that you think is immaterial and you combine it with um, another line item um, and sort of aggregate those things because you think they're immaterial, but sort of underlying this immaterial balance is a whole lot of debits and credits that if you just had accounted for them correctly would have given you a totally different picture, um, but you choose to ignore that and say, okay, well, the balance is so small, I'm just going to apply an alternative accounting treatment to it. Obviously, that's that's really manipulation. You cannot do that in your financial statements. So 
If you do have alternative accounting treatments, but they are designed to give you a particular presentation in the financial statements, um, obviously you cannot do that and that will be an error that you will need to correct. Um, it could be that you also make an incorrect assessment of materiality um, such that material transactions are accounted for as immaterial transactions. Obviously, this was, would also result in an error. So this could really just be that you, you make a calculation error, let's say potentially um, on, on a, a in, in setting your materiality threshold. Maybe you didn't fully consider, consider all of the qualitative characteristics of particular transactions. These could really lead to, you know, sort of you just make a, a mistake um, in setting your materiality. If you do have an error in the application of materiality, you would need to apply graph three. And as I've just explained to some of the questions, if you do have an error, you would need to go through the same iterative process of saying, as much as it is an error, is it a material error such that I would need to firstly apply graph three, do all the corrections, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's just something to, to think about in terms of the, the application of the standards. So I'm going to take you through now a new um, example to try and explain when there has been a change in circumstances and what the effect would be. So in this scenario, you have um, the same municipal example that we, we spoke about earlier. So remember in the, in the example that we spoke about with the municipality, they had computer peripherals and then the high value items of computer equipment. The computer peripherals and anything less than 5,000 was expensed and everything above 5,000 was going to be capitalized. Um, and obviously all the high value items as well. So in this particular scenario, let's say that in year one, the total value of computer peripherals acquired during the year with an individual cost of less than 5,000 amounted to 100,000. So that's what I expensed. Um, the total value of computer peripherals and other equipment acquired with an individual value of more than 5,000 or that obviously are not peripherals amounted to 4 million and was recognized as PP&E. So the scenario is in year one, we had 100,000 worth of assets that we expensed and 4 million that we then capitalized. In year two, the municipality establishes a major high tech call center to respond to service delivery, finance and other related queries from the public. This results in a significant investment in new computer equipment of all types, so both computer peripherals and other equipment. The establishment of the call center means that the municipality needs to reconsider its assessment of materiality for computer equipment. So given that there has been a change in the entity circumstances, um, given the nature and the volume of the computer equipment acquired during the year, as well as the expected purchases that are going to continue its subsequent reporting periods to sort of gear up for this call center, means that the municipality decides to revise its criteria. Um, so this is the qualitative criteria, as well as the materiality threshold, that only items um, with a value of less than 3,000 or less can be expensed. So obviously, given the volume and the significance of these purchases, as well as how I'm going to use computer equipment, means really that my materiality needs to be set at a lower level. So it's changing from 5,000 now to 3,000. If you, if you think about this, the result is that some of the items that you would have expensed last year, so between the 5,000 and the 3,000, um, you know, would have been expensed last year because I am lowering my materiality this year. Does it mean that I now need to re go back and capitalize those things? And, and obviously the answer to that is, is really no. And this is the reason why. So based on the fact pattern, there is a change in both the qualitative criteria as well as quantitative materiality from year one to year two. The materiality is assessed during a reporting period and at the reporting date based on facts and circumstances on the date of assessment. The municipality's determination of materiality in year one was appropriate based on all the information available and the activities at that time. It was not aware yet that they were going to establish the call center. So the 5,000 Rand that it set, as well as all the qualitative criteria were based on all the information available at that point in time. As a result, the municipality is not going to make any adjustments in year two for the computer equipment that was expensed in year one as a result of the change in materiality for the same items in year two if they were to be acquired under the revised materiality threshold. So what this means, as I've explained, is that Although you had some items last year that were less than 5,000, 
um, if they are sort of between the five and the 3000 Rand new materiality, I'm not going to go back and do anything about those. I expensed those assets based on everything that I knew at that point in time. I'm going to apply my revised materiality level of 3000 Rand going forward, so prospectively. So in this instance, there's absolutely no change that I'm going to make to the financial statements. So I hope this makes it clear that when you assess materiality, if you haven't made an error in how you have calculated materiality, your materiality is correct, assumed to be correct in that reporting period. If you do have any subsequent changes, um, they are going to be applied prospectively. The only time you will ever need to go back and correct any sort of decision about materiality is if you made an, an error, if you made a mistake. Um, or, or any of those four scenarios that we have identified. So I hope this makes it very clear to you. So I think because this is a new eye graph that you are going to adopt for the first time, there are obviously some first time sort of transitional issues that I wanted to talk to you about. So I think the first thing is that because assessments of materiality are period specific and require judgment, it is difficult for you to go back and assess whether or not your materiality that you had assessed in the past is correct. Um, so, you know, we often talk about not applying hindsight when we prepare the financial statements. Um, of course, you know, if you could go back and make different decisions about what you know today, probably you would, um, but we don't do that from an accounting perspective. If you made decisions in the past based on everything that you knew and you applied all that information correctly, we would not go back and make changes. And it's the same with how you have assessed materiality. Um, so IGRAP 21 is going to be applied on a go forward basis. So you need not assess anything related to materiality and related decisions in the past. You just move forward. Um, I think in terms of some practical issues to consider, some of these um, might be completely obvious to you, um, but I thought I would just emphasize them. So the alternative accounting treatments that you are going to develop um, for, for various items are not based on, on the accounting policies for those specific transactions in the standards. So when we talk about accounting policies, it's the principles. Um, it could be that you are going to use other standards that deal with similar items, but it could also be that you are going to look to something else and that something else would be the conceptual framework. So I think what is really important is that if you do develop alternative accounting policies, um, they should not be inconsistent with the conceptual framework. And, and obviously when we talk about the conceptual framework, it's the definitions as well as the qualitative criteria very broadly. Um, some other things to consider is that um, we have issued a guideline on materiality. It is not mandatory that you apply it. Um, you have to apply materiality because you apply GRAP 3 as part of the reporting framework. The guideline really explains how you would go about applying materiality. And it really talks, um, I think, quite well about identifying who your users are, identifying the types of decisions that they want to make, um, and then obviously setting your quantitative and qualitative materiality as a result of that. You would then need to document your materiality considerations very clearly, um, discuss them with management and your oversight structures. Um, I think there's a reason that you have an audit and a risk committee or an audit committee or whatever it is. Maybe you have a finance committee as well. I think it's, it's vitally important that you discuss these things with your governance structures. Um, you know, your board also takes responsibility for financial reporting, um, your board, your council, whatever your governance structure looks like, discuss materiality with them. I did also mention that materiality is not a one size fits all necessarily, so it's OK for you to have different materiality levels, different, different materiality numbers, different materiality criteria for different items in the financial statements. Um, you know, so, so some items are just inherently more important to users than others are, and obviously you might need to think about materiality in that context. Very importantly, document, document, document. I, I think when we often get involved in some discussions between auditors and preparers, um, you know, saying, well, I don't want to do X, Y and Z because it is, um, you know, immaterial. I, I think if we start and, you know, earthing some questions, there isn't a lot of clear documentation about how you arrived at whether something is or isn't material. So if you are making these kinds of calls as you prepare your financial statements, document them everywhere as part of your, your audit evidence. 
Again, something just to emphasize is considering again all available information, whether it's about what you know today, but also considering what you know about future periods. So please, when you when you do consider materiality, either quantitatively or qualitatively, qualitatively or quantitatively, please think about the future too. And again, we're not asking you to sort of look into a crystal ball and make all sorts of assumptions about things that may or may not happen. It's just simply going through, you know, things like your your strategy, um, specific projects that you might have in place, and obviously considering those kinds of things when you set your materiality. So I'm going to pause there and go back to ask if there are any questions before I hand over to Amanda. Uh, sorry, I want to get to where we are actually meant to take a break quickly for about yes. 15 minutes. <laughs> I just want to check the um, chat for the questions, Elisna, and then I'll give everyone a break. Um, uh, let me just see. I'm going to start at the bottom and scroll up. Um, I'm going to deal with the ones that deal specifically with um, Materia with materiality, and then I will. Um, we can answer some of the other questions as we go along through the session. So, how would you account for inflation on a yearly basis? So, this is an estimate that you would make. Um, so, let's say you are doing a discounted cash flow, whether it's for financial instruments or uh, landfill or something like that, an impairment calculation potentially as well. Um, obviously, that is an input into your measurement basis, and, and that is an estimate. So that would just purely be something that you apply on a go forward basis. Um, I think that's that's a really important question is that if you are not changing the, you know, say your measurement approach. So if you're not changing from cost or to fair value, but you're simply changing, for example, how you work out what fair value is, whether you're using changing a technique or whether you're changing the inputs, that's always going to be a change in an estimate. It's not a change in accounting policy. Um, there's an example from Nicolene where the assets of the entity are not used in the production of income or any other service delivery, but are solely used for admin. Um, can alternative accounting treatment be used in respect of review of useful lives and an associated prospective adjustment, a change in, in estimate? Um, it goes on to say an entity is required to assess the appropriateness, et cetera, et cetera, of, of Graph 17. Do we do apply the standard and therefore do review everything? Um, most of the time, there are no specific issues in the internal and external sources, but only the concept of us being able to use the assets for a few additional years since they have, for example, not broken, etc. In these circumstances, are we allowed to have assets carried at zero value that is still in use, or should we continue doing an assessment? So it depends on whether or not you've accounted for the assets in terms of Graph 17 or not. So if you apply Graph 17 to those assets, then you need to apply all the aspects of Graph 17 to those assets. You won't be able to say all of a sudden, oh, it's it's now immaterial. Um, so I, I think you need to make a distinction between I haven't decided to capitalize these assets at all, therefore Graph 17 does not apply. Um, versus saying I, I actually do apply graph 17 to these assets and then I would actually need to consider the, the, the principles in those particular standards. Um, if you do come to the conclusion that the change in the useful life is immaterial, you might decide not to change the, the useful life or the residual value or whatever it is, but you still need to apply your mind to that specific principle because you are claiming compliance with the standards of graph. I hope that makes sense. Um, when is it correct to impair fully depreciated assets? I think if they are fully depreciated, um, probably you need to at some point think about derecognizing them. I don't know that you would have impairment. There's nothing left to impair, but um, I th think that's more, rather a recognition um, issue that we need to consider. Um, so I'm going to pause there. We had scheduled a 15 minute break, so I think if we can break until 11 o'clock, that would be appreciated. I think that would give you some time um, to, to get some refreshments and then return back. Um, while we are taking a break, I'm going to have a look at the chat along with my colleagues and see if there's anything else that's still outstanding. But otherwise, we will see you back at 11 o'clock. Thank you very much.
Hi everyone, uh, welcome back. It is now 11 o'clock. We said we will resume at 11. So I hope you all had a great few minutes to stretch your legs and grab some coffee and you're ready for the next session. Um, I'm going to start us off by sharing with you some of the results of the review of GRAP24 that we did. GRAP24 is, of course, the presentation of budget information in the financial statement. So um, let me just give you some background on the project and an approach to the review that we had followed. Um, so let me start with what does GRAP24 require? Firstly, it is a comparison of your budget and actual amounts in your financial statements that you need to prepare. Um, so, so this is really the, the crux of what the standard requires. And it is required by all entities that either are required or that elect to make their approved budgets publicly available and they must be held accountable for those publicly available budgets um, by by the public. So that's in short what it is, what is required and who it is required from. We have reviewed the application of the standard of GRAP um, to assess whether entities are currently complying with the requirements of the standards and whether they are reporting information that's useful to the users and that are of quality, and also to identify whether there are any application or uh, implementation issues that entities struggle with and to see whether there's a role that the board could play to help entities to comply with requirements. Um, I just want to mention that there may also be legislated requirements in this area. The review did not consider whether entities are complying with legislation. Um, you may also know that the Office of the Accountant General issues GRAP accounting guidelines on each of the standards. There is one for GRAP 24. So the review also did not consider whether entities are applying those uh, guidelines, uh, the specifically the GRAP 24 accounting guideline of the Accountant General. So the outcome of this was really for the board to assess whether there were any steps needed by the board to amend the standard or more guidance that we need to provide, um, or maybe ask some of our other stakeholders to help us to provide guidance in this area. So the approach to review was sort of a stepped approach where we started with a desktop review. Um, what this means is that we have a look at a number of entities' financial statements. We usually, in terms of our policy, look at the latest audited available information. So for this review specifically, we looked at 2019-2020 financial statements of entities. Um, and then we we form sort of an initial assessment about whether entities are applying the requirements in the standard appropriately. Of course, there are some limitations in terms of um, not all, knowing all the background about why entities would have disclosed things in a certain way or not uh, presented things in a certain way, for example. So that is where the next step in the process comes in. We then engage with stakeholders um, and we have for this review to get the understanding from them uh, why they would present things in certain ways and to get an understanding of some of the root causes that could give rise to some of the issues we identify when we do the desktop review. We also, through this phase of the review, uh, hear from our stakeholders what other issues they may be with the practical uh, implementation of the requirements, what challenges do they face in, in their environments. Um, and then we also ask for their input on the, the proposals that we can make to the board as a secretariat um, so that we know what we are proposing will result in better application of the standard. Then the last step is that we present our findings to the board and the um, feedback from stakeholders as well as proposals and the board deliberates that. This has happened the, the end of last year, um, so we can now share with you some preliminary results from this review. So let's have a look at the results of the review as well as the proposed actions. Um, I do want to mention that I'm going to, in the coming slides, take you through some of the highlights of the review. But there is a review report that we are working on. It will be tabled for the board to approve in March. 
Um, so you can look out for that towards April this year, and that review report will contain all the detail of the findings and recommendations that we have from this review. So please look out for that for all the detail. So if I start with what we found, um, firstly, just a general observation, I must say that um, we were pleased to note that there was positive results in most of the areas entities mostly did adhere to the requirements of the standard. Then we also heard from stakeholders that they thought the standard is understandable and it is well implemented. So I think that was a, a positive start to the review. There were, however, a number of specific observations in a number of areas that arose from the review, um, some other practice issues as well that were identified. So these areas are included on the slide, and I'm going to take you through each of these in a bit more detail in the coming slides. So just to share with you on a high level the areas. Firstly, the applicability of GRAP24. So I shared with you a sort of a high level requirement in the beginning. We'll look at that again. Then the format of the presentation of the comparison of budget and actual information. Also having a look at the presentation itself of the comparison of budget and actual information. Then changes from approved to final budget. We'll have a look at, at what the requirement is and what we saw. Then the comparison must be presented on a comparable basis. Um, so we will have a look at that. The reconciliation of actual amounts on a comparable basis to the actual amounts in the financial statements. And then lastly, what we saw around no disclosures, um, there are three sort of areas, the budgetary basis, which includes the classification, the period, as well as the entities that are included in the budget. So we will go through each of these in a bit more detail. Let's start with the applicability of GRAP24. Um, so just to take you through what the requirements are here. Um, so entities apply the standard when they are required or they elect to make their budgets publicly available. So publicly available means that it is approved and made available to the public at large um, by tabling tabling the budget either in parliament or in legislatures or in municipal councils. Um, it depends on the type of entity that, that would give rise to the different uh, various forums at which it's tabled. And the second party, so firstly publicly available, um, the second party's entities are held accountable for these budgets by the public. Um, so that is the, the second part, the accountability part for the budget. So if those um, those two things are in place for you as an entity, it means that you do need to apply the standard. So um, we did not identify from the review any entities that were supposed to apply the, uh, the standard but did not apply the, the standard. But I think we did hear some of the issues uh, from our stakeholders that all that they are not always sure what does it mean to have your public your budget made publicly available. And we also heard that there were some disagreements in some instances between preparers and auditors about what publicly available means. So um, I think this mostly arose in the area of public entities where it may be unclear because there are no explicit requirements in legislation for these types of entities to make their budgets publicly available. Um, then we, we also found that entities and preparers now do not necessarily document uh, in a lot of detail how they arrive at their conclusion whether their budgets are publicly available or not. Um, so that, of course, would always be of assistance when uh, some external party like the auditors or even um, internal levels of review consider your decisions. So the way forward on this one is that we are going to develop an, a fact sheet with a number of different areas we'll touch on through the coming slides. Um, with some more guidance for preparers. So the first one would be to have more guidance on what it means to be publicly available for your budget. And we will also pass this on to the OAG to consider in updating their GRAP accounting guideline. 
um, they may be able to consider some specific guidance for public entities based on on different scenarios. The next one is on the format of the presentation of the comparison. I'll start again with what the requirements are. So entities must uh, present this comparison as one of two methods. Firstly, a separate additional financial statement. So you'll have a statement of comparison of budget and actual information um, somewhere in um, and amongst your statement of financial performance position and the cash flow statement, um, changes in net assets as well. Or the other alternative is you can have additional budget columns in your existing statement. So in your statement of financial performance or position um, or cash flow statement. Um, this option, however, would only be available to you if your budget and your financial statements are prepared on the same basis. So same basis means if you are on the cruel basis of accounting and you have prepared your budget on the cruel basis, you are on the same basis and you can apply option B. Um, if the budget is on the cash or modified cash basis, but your financial statements are prepared on a cruel basis, it means that you only really have option A, um, which is to have the separate statement. So the majority of entities went for the option A to prepare a separate statement, which is not um, wrong by any means. They are allowed to do that. We just did note that even when entities did have the option of adding the columns to their existing statements so the basis were the same, they still opted for option A, which is the, sec the separate statement. Um, just some of the, the findings and the issues that we noted specifically in the municipal environment is they are required by the, um, the Treasury, I think for their information purposes, to prepare another statement called the appropriation statement, which has uh, many similarities with this comparison that you would do with your budget and your, your actual information. So we noted that they would present a different options for for the budget and actual information. Um, so some of them had two statements. They would have the comparison as well as the appropriation statement in the financial statements. Then there were others who did not have the appropriation statement in the financial statements. They sometimes had it in an annexure, which is now, of course, not part of your financial statements, but may be published together. And there are entities who only um, had the appropriation statement in their financial statements and not the comparison. So like I mentioned, there may be similarities between them, um, but I'm not sure that they are exactly the same. And only having the appropriation statement may not meet all the requirements of GRAP 24. Um, so what we... we um, heard the root cause is here and this actually links back to a project that we did a number of years ago um, where we noted the same thing was that we developed a frequently asked question to help entities when they have similar information in the financial statements around budget and actual information um, that highlights that information should not be repeated. You only present the information once. Um, you can elaborate on that information in the notes if, if you want to, or have it in an annexure, which means it is then outside of the financial statements. So we did note that not all entities are aware of this frequently asked question that we have. Um, the board did encourage entities to consider the frequently asked question when they prepare their financial statements and um, then again just highlighting that information that is repeated would be confusing to your user so we would um, we would urge you to avoid doing that. Then also part of the format of the presentation of the comparison um, a requirement is that entities should present a comparison um, of the budget and the actual information consistent with how they have prepared the budget. So that means consistent in the areas of the clauses, the classifications and the headings that they use. So this statement is really about your um, budget that's that's publicly available and that's approved and we'll get to some changes that may be made to that in a few slides 
and then taking your financial information and putting it next to your budget so that it is comparable to to your budget in terms of of the format um so what we we did note um Sorry, just something as a side note to the requirement is we did get questions about why this is necessary, but it is really so that comparisons can be made by your relevant oversight authority that's responsible for approving your budget um, because they, of course, are familiar with the format of the budget and they have approved that. So in order to assist them make the comparison, the financial information is adjusted so that it's comparable. Um, so on the, the findings and the issues, the, the clauses, the classifications and the headings, etc. of the statement were mostly the same as what you would find in the financial statements rather than um, the way it is in the budget. So we have noted that entities are, are not really familiar with the requirement or they don't really understand the requirement. And for this reason, the fact sheet will also include some guidance on um, the method and the format and extent of the comparison that you need to, to prepare. We've also noted on this that users of financial statements and specifically uh, like the audit committee and rating agencies, they are unsure what the information should be used for. So this does maybe speak to a more a broader issue, but users do not really understand the purpose of the information. The National Treasury does have a project on um, preparing a guideline for users of financial statements that would help them understand and um, interrogate and use the information in financial statements better. And we will communicate with them that they consider this as part of, of that project of theirs. The next one is the presentation of the comparison. So the requirement again, if we start with that, is that entities present a comparison between the last approved and the final budget amounts, the budget and the actual amounts on a comparable basis, as well as explanations of material differences between the budget and the actual amounts. You are also allowed to cross reference here to another report outside of your financial statements if you do not want to provide this within the financial statements itself. Um, so we'll look at the, the next slide a bit more about the lost and um, the lost approved and final budget. So the findings and the issues here is that some entities did not provide the explanations of material differences, while others did not apply materiality at all, and they explained all the differences that were identified. We also noted that the quality of the explanations provided were often poor and not really understandable for a user. Um, then I think there was also some instances we know explanations were provided, but we are unsure if that is due to materiality that was apl applied. Um, entities in these cases did not necessarily have information in their financial statements about the materiality threshold that they had set for explaining these variances. So the, the root causes here is that entities don't really understand how to apply materiality in the context of graph 24. Um, we also noted from the review that the statement seems to be prepared um, sort of as a side note, maybe the last of the statements that's, that's been prepared for the financial statement. So it's not given um, that priority when financial statements are prepared. So what the board decided here for a way forward is guidance on how materiality and specifically now in the context of GRAB 24 needs to be applied will be included in the fact sheet. So I think earlier on um, in the earlier presentations today, you heard about our guideline on materiality. So with reference to that, we will add something to the fact sheet. We will also communicate this to the OAG so that they can consider guidance for the, uh, the GRAP accounting guideline. Okay. I do just want to pause and have a look um, before we move on to the next one. I see that there are a number of, of posts, so let me just see if there are any questions so that I don't get too far behind. OK, um, just some administrative issues.
OK, so let me start with Funani. Um, please explain this, especially clarifying the last part. Grab 24 paragraph 22 also states where budgets are prepared on a cruel basis and encompass the full set of the financial statements. Additional budget columns can be added to the primary financial statements required by standards of GRAP. In some cases, budgets prepared on a cruel basis may be presented in the form of only certain of the primary financial statements that comprise the full set. For example, the budget may be presented as a statement of financial performance or a cash flow statement. So this um, speaks to the extent of the comparison that you are required to provide in your financial statements. Um, and it would be linked to what your budget is. So if you only have an approved budget that's publicly available for which you are held accountable for two of the statements, so let's say your statement of financial performance and your cash flow statement, your comparison um, for GRAP24 purposes would speak to those two statements. So you do not then need to present this comparison for your statement of financial position for which you do not have that budget or for your statement of changes in its um, assets, as an example. So I hope that clarifies it for you. Otherwise, please let me know. Um, OK, Busy Siwi, with regards to entities that are held publicly accountable, when disclosing changes to the regional budget and adjusted budget, must the shifting also be shown? OK, we are actually going to get to that in the slide that I have up now. Um, Mariet, what will be seen as the last approved budget? OK, so also this slide now. Um, Stefan, as the disclosure of Graph 24 starts with budget, which is highly regulated, can you apply materiality to this regulated report? OK, so I think that we will we will also touch on um, on this slide. Raquel, for variance explanations, is it acceptable pr to provide explanation at a high level, for example, for all revenue from exchange transactions instead of for each line item? So, um, Raquel, I think you would need to consider your materiality, and this, I think, comes back to the, the guidance that we are going to provide to maybe make that link with materiality for entities here. So um, you would, of course, when it comes to materiality, need to think about what information your users would need from, from this. And um, therefore, if you do have a, a statement of comparison that is quite detailed because that is how you determined it to be useful for your users, and there are variances that you determine to be material for uh, many of those items, then I think you would need to explain all those items separately, unless the reason is maybe the same for a number of them and you can combine them. Coming back, I guess, to the earlier comment about repetition that we don't want in the apps, um, repetition is unnecessary. So if you can combine them because the reason is the same, then I think that would also be suitable. Then Sandiso, paragraph six of Grab 24 defines the comparable basis as meaning the actual amounts presented on the same accounting basis, same classification basis for the same entities and for the same period as the budget. The approved budget is not comparable to the financial statements when it's not prepared on the same accounting basis, same classification basis, same period and for same entities. Um, then paragraph 104 of GRAP 1 explains that classification in relation to expenditure refers to how the entity presents the analysis of expenditure in the statement of financial performance, either nature or function, um, whichever the entity thinks will be reliable and relevant. Then paragraph 40 of GRAP 24 also gives examples to clarify the meaning of classification basis as it states that formats and classification schemes adopted for presentation of the approved budget may also differ from the formats adopted for the financial statements. An approved budget may classify items on the same basis as is adopted for the financial statements, for example, um, economic nature or function. Alternatively, the budget may classify items by specific programs, um, then we have some examples of programs there or program components linked to performance objectives. 
Um, some examples there which differ from classifications adopted in the financial statements. The statement of comparison presents the analysis of both the approved budget and actual amount by the economic nature. Um, the approved budget and the apps are thus on the same classification basis. Okay. So I think if I understand you're asking why do you include same heading in your interpretation of same classification basis when it's not referred to in the standard, the only the standard only refers to nature or um, the nature or function. OK, so I mean, I think it is just again for the users to be able to compare what you have in your budget with what you have in your financial statement. So if you have um, certain headings in your budget and you are comparing it at that level, then you would also need to have that same um, or, or you would need to have your financial information um, worked to be in that same comparable basis as your budget. So I think it just comes back to that overall principle that the financial statements may need to be adjusted so that it is comparable to the budget if it is not already. Okay, Martin, is the approved budget uh, the original budget or the adjustment budget? Okay, this slide that we are on now, I'll get to that next. Um, and then, Noni, if the variance is more than 10% and the budget line item is immaterial, is it necessary to provide explanation? So I do think what we've seen is that entities often use the threshold like 5% or 10% when they determine what would be a material variance. Um, but it again comes back to there seems to be uncertainty about how you apply materiality with this statement and, and with the variance explanation. So we are going to provide more guidance in the fact sheet on that. So let me go on to uh, this fourth item that I have, the changes from the approved to the final budget. So firstly, the requirement is the explanation of changes between approved and final budget must be provided. This can be in the notes or if you already have it outside of your um, of your financial statements in another report, you may include a cross reference to that. So let's talk about what the final budget is. This is the approved budget, so you have an approved budget which may be adjusted for changes that's made by the entity and approved by the relevant authority. So these changes may be as a result of reallocations or other factors such as budget perimeters that change. So depending on the type of entity, the final budget may not be made publicly available. You may have just a process between you and the approval authority um, to make those, those changes um, authoritative or official. <laughs> so in some cases, the approved and the final budget may also be the same if there were no reallocations or, um, or any of these changes that have been made. Again, just on the purpose of why it is necessary to disclose this information um, in the notes or elsewhere if you have it, is to assist users to hold the entity accountable for compliance with the relevant approved report. Um, so I'm sure you can appreciate it would not really help if the comparison is done on the approved budget that's publicly available, but afterwards there were significant changes that um, are they not taken into account. So just on um, on the, the types of things that you need to explain here, the standard does not explicitly refer to material changes that need to be applied here. Um, the budget is, however, a legislated process and any changes to the budget would be driven by legislation as well or, um, or secondary legislation. So in terms of the normal principles of materiality, it could be material either by the quality um, of it, so the nature of it, or the quantity of it, the amount of it. So when it comes to legislation and um, what we are talking about here, 
the nature of it being a legislative um, process that's followed to change the budget means that it is material in nature. So rather than the amount, um, the nature of it would make it material. So we would also help in the in the fact sheet to make that link between the, the qualitative materiality of these changes. Then on the comparable basis, so the requirement in GRAP 24 is that the comparison of the budget and the actual amounts must be presented on a comparable basis to the budget. So this means the same um, accounting basis, the classification system, the period and the entities. So I think this also um, links with your question earlier, Sandy, so that we are getting to here in detail. So just again, um, what does the comparable basis to the budget mean? It means that the actual amounts should be adjusted to reflect the same basis of accounting. So this would be, it, is it cash or accrual or modified cash? The same classification system. So that could be the nature or the function or the, the other basis. Um, then also the same period and the same entity. So if you are in an uh, in an individual entity or um, or are you a group of entities which include maybe some but not all of the entities. So all those things need to be on the same basis. So the approved budget we spoke about now it is a legal document through which entities will be held accountable and as such the actual amounts in the financial statements need to be adjusted so that it is comparable with with that budget. So I think just before we get to the findings on the slide, um, the majority of entities included in the review did prepare the budget and financial statements on the same basis. Um, so there were no adjustments then necessary for them. Um, then most of the entities that prepared their budgets on the cash or the modified cash basis did adjust their actual amounts, which would have been on a cruel basis, so that it's comparable to the budget. So they did make those adjustments. Um, for municipalities, I think we have been aware of classification differences that exist, and this is driven by the regulated um, budget, or sorry, the budget regulations that exist for municipalities, which are not necessarily aligned to the standards of GRAB. Um, but we didn't necessarily see that coming through. So what we also find is because of a lot of boilerplate disclosures and information um, on the budgetary basis, the classifications and um, et cetera, that is in the financial statements, it was sometimes inconsistent between the different areas of the financial statements. So the accounting policy would explain one thing about the basis or the classification system of the budget, whereas um, the notes would explain something different. And um, there were also some times when those two would identify differences, but that did not come through in the comparison itself. So what we've uh, noted is that entities do not understand what a comparable basis means and how the adjustments need to be processed and, um, and reflected. And that a basis difference would also include the accounting basis and classification differences. So we've also seen entities do not adjust the boilerplate notes or the accounting policies, and therefore it does not speak to the entity circumstances. So the way forward the board um, decided here is that guidance will be included on the fact sheet to clarify what is a comparable basis. And we will also ask the OAG to consider this for their accounting guideline on GRAP 24. Just going to take a, a step quickly before we continue. I'm just going to go through the last two and then I'll have a look at the chat again. So um, the next one is the reconciliation of the actual amount. So when the financial statements and the budgets are prepared on a comparable basis, um, you present a reconciliation of the financial statements to the budget on the face of the statement and in the notes. 
Um, you separately identify any basis, timing and entity differences for specified subtotals. So the basis includes the classification differences and then uh, the timing if there are year in differences among entities um, or among the budget and the, the actual information and then um, this, the actual entities included. So the, the subtotals that I'm referring to here is specified in graph 24. It's different for the accrual and for um, the cash or modified cash basis. But for accrual, it includes total revenues, total expenses, and then also net cash flows from operating um, um, <laughs> investing and financing activities. So for each of these, you are required to present this reconciliation. So the purpose of this requirement is to identify the major sources of differences that exist between your actual amounts on the budget basis and the amounts that you would have in your financial statement. So if you have, um, of course, you have your accrual information in your financial statements. If you need to make adjustments so that it's on the cash um, basis, then you need to show what those changes were that you needed to make to get to the comparable basis of your actual information. So on the, the findings and the issues, if we firstly look at the accrual basis um, of presenting the budget, then the review could not confirm the extent of classification differences, but no um, reconciliations were provided for these entities. So it may be that that is correct, or it may be that it was not identified and explained. Uh, for the budgets that were on a cash or a modified cash basis, the entities that presented the reconciliation did not um, reconcile to the specified subtotals. So we have those subtotals I mentioned also for the cash and modified cash about the operating activities, uh, financing activities and investing activities. So the causes here is that entities do not understand when to provide the reconciliation and that basis differences also include classification differences that you may have. Also, the reconciliation could be challenging to uh, prepare. It may require you to, dwell, to delve into the detail of your, your budget um, system and your items that make up your line items for financial statement purposes to identify where those differences could lie. One thing that the board did note that could help is um, there may not be a need to be so overly prescriptive about the specific items that need to be reconciled. So the board did make a decision to be less prescriptive about that in graph 24. Instead of having those specified line items, there would be guiding principles that would help entities decide which line items to reconcile. The only thing is that for comparability purposes, entities would need to uh, have the same items reconciled from one year to the next. So you can't decide in one year to be revenue and the next year um, to be receivables. Just now a silly example. That's not a, a good example that I used now. Apologies for that. But um, I mean, you can't change the, the items that you reconcile from one year to the next. So we'll get to how these amendments would be picked up in the standards of GRAP um, at the end of the presentation. The last one I do want to talk about is the disclosure in the notes of the financial statements. So the requirement is that entities must disclose in the notes the budgetary basis and the classification basis adopted in the approved budget the period of the approved budget and the entities that are included in the approved budget. So we have noted that many of the entities have not provided all of the information that's required by, um, by the standards, and there were also inconsistencies and inaccuracies in the information, especially when you compare the policies and the notes and um, the budget information in the, the actual comparison statement. So this again, I think, comes down to the boilerplate information that's often used in the financial statements and the fact that preparing this comparison may not be a priority 
and um, it's maybe be left to the last um, the last few <laughs> few days of preparing your financial statements. We did have illustrative examples in the, the standard previously when um, before it became effective and the board did think that these examples could be reinstated as that could help preparers to um, to understand the, the type of information that required and what it would look like. So that would help to improve the quality of the information in the financial statements. So before I go on to the next steps in the project, I'm just going to pause a little bit and have a look at the chat. Um, thank you, Amanda and Janine. I see that you have responded to quite a bit of the comments. Um, let me see if I can identify whether they are any ones that are not responded to yet. OK, if um, just now from from my quick scan, it does seem like all the, the queries have been responded to. OK, thank you to my colleagues. If I have missed any uh, comments, then I'll get back to that after the presentation. I'll just do a, a bit more of a thorough <laughs> look through then. OK, so the next steps here would be that we are going to develop the fact sheet. I've alluded to that in a, quite a number of, of slides that you've seen now, and you would have seen the amendments to the standard that we are also um, going to propose here that would be made. Um, sorry, I think I just skipped over. Yeah, OK, so the amendments to the standard would be the uh, less prescriptive line items to reconcile back to, as well as reinstating the illustrative examples. We are going to pick this up as part of our next improvements to the standards of GRAP project. So you will see that um, probably uh, in the next um, reporting period coming through. Um, I mean, us, us exposing it for your comments. Then the other thing I alluded to right in the beginning is that we are going to publish a review report um, which will contain all the detail of the findings from the review. So you can please have a look for that, look out for that. And we will also find ways in which we can communicate this with our stakeholders. So um, if you don't follow us on social media, please do uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. We do publish quite relevant uh, topics and and um, content on there and this will include some of the feedback from this review we will also then engage with the national treasury and the auditor general just to inform them of the findings of the review and with the oag um, of course for them to update their accounting guideline okay so just one other question i see that came through okay Thanks, Janine, <laughs> about when the fact sheets will come out. So the next thing that I'm really quickly going to take you through is some new frequently asked questions that we've recently published. So I first just want to talk about the FAQs quickly in general. Um, these are developed by us as the Secretariat and apologies, um, they are not authoritative. They do not go through the board's normal due process. So it's really just us that, um, that try to help you with applying the standards. They are available on our website, so you can access them through the link. I believe the slides have been made available to you. The latest version of the FAQs is November 2021. Um, so we do update them from time to time and you will see the versions change. We do have a history of the changes in the document itself, so you can you can keep track of what changed um, and that would be easy for you to follow. I do just want to mention that probably next month you will see a new version come out. We, we will focus on changes to the reporting framework for 21-22. So as you saw earlier on, um, not many changes that have been made to the framework for 21-22. So on the, the changes specifically for this version, the November version that we've made, these really came from the projects that we did on heritage assets where we did a post-implementation review. So that was quite a thorough review of the standard 
and the outcome was in some areas that we will develop frequently asked questions or amend existing frequently asked questions. Then I mentioned, um, I think the research paper we published on GRAP2, the cash flow statement. So alongside that, there was also an FAQ that we developed. So those were really the two projects that um, led to these FAQs. So firstly, um, FAQ 7.4 was an existing frequently asked question we had on how specimens held for research should be classified in an entity's financial statements. So what we've done with the FAQ is to just firstly link it back to only items that meet the recognition criteria are recognized in the financial statement. So you first need to know that you have an asset um, and then secondly, you need to know that it meets the definition of a heritage asset before you can classify it as heritage in the financial statements. We do have an asset classification decision tree that's also available on our website. So if you know that you have an item that meets the recognition criteria of an asset, but you're unsure how to classify it, that decision tree will help you get to the right standard of grab. Um, then we have a new frequently asked question on whether the presentation of assets in financial statements will increase an asset's risk profile. So there was a concern with information about heritage assets in being in the financial statements that that may give rise to them being prone to be stolen or um, or otherwise manipulated. So the standards standards of grab require you to um, again, coming back to the recognition criteria, recognize all those items. And when it comes to what you present and what you disclose, materiality does play quite a big role in making that assessment. So you do have to comply with requirements of the standards and present um, certain information as required by the standards for everything that is material. But there is uh, aggregation that you can do in your financial statements. Again, um, according to what is allowed within the standards. Then um, I think we've also noted that there are other standards of GRAP that may also have types of assets that could have sensitive information around them. So it's it's the same principles that would apply. Then the next new frequently asked question was 217 on whether assets on land should be accounted for separately from the land itself. So this principle is established in the standards that land and any buildings or other structures on the land are separate, even if they are acquired together. Um, again, materiality can be applied, so maybe if, if it's immaterial, you can combine the two. So the same principles would apply for heritage assets that they should be separate, separated and accounted for separately from the land. Then the next new frequently asked question is 318. This is one that resulted from our cash flow statement review. So the question got asked how the cash movements in consumer deposits should be presented in the cash flow statement. So we had a look at the requirements in GRAP2 on cash flow statements, and we noted that consumer um, deposits, the movement in, in that um, should be reflected as a change in working capital. So that would mean it's part of your operating activities that you present in your cash flow statement. The next frequently asked question is also a new one from the Heritage Assets Project. So what should be considered when determining a reliable value for a heritage asset? There are a number of requirements in the standard about this, and the FAQ just interprets those in the context of heritage assets. So um, fair value has a number of different elements to it, so they must be knowledgeable parties, they must be willing, um, it must be an arm's length transaction. So all those elements are unpacked in the FAQ for heritage assets specifically. Then the last new frequently asked question also on heritage assets is how items collected by an entity should be classified in its financial statements. So there is a bit of similarity here with the very first FAQ I spoke about in that firstly you recognize assets that meet the recognition criteria and once you know that you can recognize the asset you are going to follow the the classification decision tree um, and only if items meet the definition of a heritage asset 
will they be classified as a heritage asset in your financial statements? So that was uh, quite a mouthful that I've shared with you now. Um, let me just have a look and see if there are any unaddressed comments. OK, I, I don't think so. I do think my colleagues have addressed all your questions and your comments. So with that, um, thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to my colleague Amanda Bueta and um, let me just stop sharing the slides, then she can share her slides with you. Good morning, everyone. I'm just struggling to, to get everything set from my side. Um, can you all see the slide presentation? Just see, is it is it running on your side? I hope so. Uh, so um, again, um, welcome this um, to, to do this discussion um, and the workshop um, today from my side. Um, I'm actually going to go through some of the exposure drafts that are currently out for comment, but to note that these exposure drafts are not technical in nature. It more is around what you want us to do for the next three years, starting at um, on the 1st of April 2023, and then secondly around um, what the due process is that the board follow in developing and setting the standards of GRAP. So really these two exposure drafts are not um, technical exposure drafts, but I still think it's important for stakeholders to, to consider these exposure drafts in order to provide comment on them. So I'm going to start off with ED194. That is taking stock, and this is really an exposure draft that deals with inputs around the ASB's work, work program for 2024 to 2026. The comment period is closing on the 18th of March, and the next one is around the due process handbook with the comment closing on the 31st of March. So the ISB's activities are based on a three year work program, and we are currently executing the last part of the 21 to 23 work program. So now we need to look ahead and start planning for um, for the next three, year, um, three years for the medium term. And this means that we need to identify the potential projects and the activities that the board wants to undertake as from the 1st of April 2023 up until the 31st of March 2026 and we refer to that as the 2024 to 2026 reporting period or work program. So the objective of this exposure of ED194 is really to take stock on the ASB's activities and to consider the potential projects that the board would like to uh, and should undertake within its next um, three year work program consultation phase cycle. The theme of the um, of the exposure draft is taking stock. And this is really to allow the ISB some time to assess where we are, what we aim to achieve and how we can actually do things better. And therefore, it's quite important that from a stakeholder's perspective, we do obtain your comments and inputs in order to, to make things better and that, to ensure that we do things better from a standard setter's perspective. So the ISB has the cap capacity to undertake around 18 projects within the three year cycle. Um, but this really depends on factors such as the timing of completing our existing projects. And one of these projects um, involves um, the social benefit standard. Then also it involves the complexity of the projects, the level of um, consultation that is required with the stakeholders, and then from the ISB's perspective, the availability of resources. Around the criteria that the board applies to select specific projects, these are, first of all, no guidance exists either in the public and the private sector, or there's no new or existing um, for the new or the existing issues, which really results in inappropriate and divergent accounting requirements. So in terms of that, examples, the, the um, ICRAP that Janine has spoken about, the effect of past decisions on materiality is an example um, of such a project. Then the second criteria is this, that there's inconsistent ap application of the existing guidance and principles within the standards, which then results in inappropriate or divergent accounting results. And again, an example of this is um, when the board issued the landfill guideline as well as the housing arrangement guideline in order to address these inconsistencies and divergent accounting practices. 
The next criteria is the importance of maintaining alignment with IPSAS and IFRS, and the annual improvements project is an example of such a project, along with GRAP24, where the, um, the employee benefit standard was updated, or pardon me, GRAP25, the employee standard was updated to align with the international back best practice. And the last criteria that the board consider is the importance of maintaining the current suite of standards to ensure that they are relevant and appropriate uh, um, as applied by entities. So once we've identified the projects, the board then applies the following um, criteria to prioritize which projects within the three year period should be um, addressed first. The first one is the resources available to the ASB to undertake the projects, and that includes the capacity of the secretariat as well as the board, as well as the financial resources that may be required to execute the specific project. Secondly, the financial management environment with which we operate, and for that we also consider the agendas of other organisations, for example, the National Treasury. Then also the capacity of the stakeholders to participate in a specific public consultation process and how much time is needed for the stakeholders to actively participate in this process. Then the next criteria is the resources that's available to the stakeholders to implement the new or the revised standard of GRAP. Then the impact of the issue, um, in particular, the significance of, of accountability and decision making and how widespread the issue is within the public sector will also determine whether or not the project needs to be prioritised and where it needs to be prioritised within the three year um, work programme cycle. And lastly, the last item that the, the criteria that the board consider is around the urgency of the issue to the South African public sector. So let's just have a quick look around what ED194 is all about. Um, it's important, I think, for, as I've said, for you to participate in part of the process because really your inputs will determine what the board is going to work on within the next three years. There are various um, engagements that we have already set up, so you can either follow that on our newsletter um, or that it's available on the website as well. So please register for these discussions and these, bot, um, these workshops so that you can participate and provide and share your input as part of this process. So the first issue really that the board looks, uh, looks at is really to, to get an understanding of what gaps are there currently in the literature. So this really outlines um, to the stakeholders what projects the board thinks it should undertake and enable the stakeholders then to comment on the proposals made by the board. So the first question really is to understand what gaps are there in the existing literature. And from that perspective, the board has identified two projects. The first one is really around the social benefits. Um, and this is an existing project that the board is currently working on. And one of the projects that will actually flow over to the next work program, um, you know, to, the, to the next ISB's work program. That is around social benefits, so it's meaning it is cash and in-kind benefits like emergency relief or food parcels and how entities need to account for that. And the next one is around intergovernmental transfers or transfer expenses, as some of you may know it, and that really is around the transfers of grants, equitable shares, but from an expense side where we need and how we need to account for that. For these two projects, the IPSAS B is currently working um, on these projects. So for that, from that perspective, um, as you know, the board aligns with what the IPSAS standard is, um, is about. And hence, we will have to wait for the IPSAS B. But those are some of the gaps that the board has identified um, and that, the, that in the board's view, we need to address as part of the, the next three year work program. Um, then also um, another objective of the um, of the work program consultation is to identify transactions and arrangements that specifically acquire accounting guidance from the ISB. And from this perspective, in the past, like I've mentioned, we have developed the housing guideline as an example. So really to get an understanding from the stakeholders' perspective, what are the transactions and arrangements require accounting guidance? So really your input to this extent will be quite, quite useful. Then around the convergence with international standards. 
So as I've said, the standards of GRAP are based on IPSAS, and in the absence of an IPSAS, the board considers the IFRS standards. So as part of the work program consultation, it's important to understand what the IPSAS B and the IIS B is working on and what is will be relevant for the local environment. So based on the IPSAS B and the ISB, who is also consulting on their work programs, they are currently uncertain as to what, um, from a board's perspective, we are uncertain as to what will happen in future from an IISB um, and the IPSAS B's perspective. And hence, the focus of the board will only be on IPSAS and IFRS standards that have already been approved by the I, by the by the stakeholders. So we're not looking um, towards their future program, but focusing on what they have approved and the standards that they are currently revising for inclusion in our Okay, it seems as if I'm back. Can can you hear me? Can somebody just perhaps give me a thumbs up? All right, thanks, Elisna. So yes, unfortunately, we are now scheduled for for load shedding. Um, I think I'm going to keep my camera off just for purposes of um, of connection, if if that's acceptable to all of you. Um, so going back to the presentation, then around what um, the board think um, from an international perspective we need to focus on is first of all um, the measurement of assets and liabilities in the public sector. So really this project comprises guidance around the fair value um, and this is really based on the international standard IFRS 13. So it will also include the guidance around the measurement basis for assets and liabilities in the public sector and the IPSAS B intends to complete this project late in 2022. The next project in, involves the revision to the conceptual framework, and that is again from the IPSAS B perspective. They are undertaking limited scope reviews in order to update their conceptual framework with that of the IISB. Um, and later on, when we discuss some of some of the IPSAS B's existing projects, you'll see that that is part of that. So, really, the proposal from the board. Alex, I think Amanda is having load shedding. Um, just just give me a minute to see if I can get hold of her. Otherwise, I'll, I'll take over presenting from her. Just give me a moment. Amanda, I, I think we've lost you for, for quite a bit of time. Um, I think if you could maybe start with the slide again. Otherwise, if, if you want me to, I can also take over presenting. Oh. Oh. Thank <laughs> you. 
Amanda, we cannot hear you. I, oh. I don't know if it's your connection. Um, uh, it might be very bad. I don't know if, if you would like me to take over presenting from you, perhaps. to the international standards is also addressed in the local I think I'm having a connection problem. Um, um, Okay, I seem to be back. Can everybody hear me? Yes, Amanda. I think we lost you again. Amanda, we can't hear you again. Okay, I see Amanda's leaving. Uh, let's just see if she exits and rejoins if it assists. Sorry, colleagues. Um, it's so typical that whenever we plan these events that ESCOM is not playing the game with load shedding, which obviously does impact us quite a bit. Um, just give us a couple of minutes and hopefully she can rejoin and we can hear her. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll take over presenting from her. Thank you.
sorry, now I'm muted. <laughs> I think Amanda's is having some difficulty joining, so just give me a minute and I'll get back to um, more or less where she was. Um, and I'll just carry on from there in the interest of time. I think we were um, more or less on the international standards. We'd spoken about social benefits, and I think this was more or less where Amanda started breaking up. So let me start from here. Um, so, so in terms of the international standards and our alignment with IPSIS, um, we align primarily with IPSIS. Obviously, if there is an IFRS that we need to align to, we will do so. Um, there is a really a long list of, of standards that um, the IPSIS B has issued or is in the process of issuing. Um, and what we are trying to figure out is what exactly they would be potentially finished with um, for us to start working on in 2024 to 2026. For those of you involved with our, our work, you would know that at least there are two really important projects on, on revenue um, as well as on leases. I think leases, they have finished and, and issued the first part of the leases standard, which is aligned with IFRS 16, but they have not issued the second part that deals with public sector issues. When we did discuss the ED here locally, I think people said to us, look, they would rather wait until um, the Ipsos B is completely finished with leases before we go ahead and, and make those changes and adopt a new standard. So we're not sure if they are going to finish the second part of the leases project during 2024 to 2026. So we haven't included that on the list of things that we want to converge with, um, nor have we included revenue. I think they are having some difficulty in in coming up with a consistent approach for both exchange and, and non-exchange revenue. They did issue two EDs. They got a lot of comment back. Um, yeah, some in support of, but a lot not in support of what they are doing. Um, so probably that would need another exposure draft, which seems quite way, quite a way off at this point in time. So our proposals in the work program for 24-26 is to deal with um, the measurement of assets and liabilities. So this would be, um, it would be to some extent an alignment with IFRS 13 on leases, which is about um, us being able to um, obviously get some guidance on, on fair value related matters, but it would also provide guidance on the measurement of things like replacement cost for assets and cost of fulfillment for liabilities. So I think it will solve quite a number of practical sort of implementation and application issues that we find in the public sector now, particularly in relation to the measurement of, of, of assets, um, whether it's land, um, buildings, you know, the valuation thereof, as well as impairment calculations. So I, I definitely think this will help. It will also address some of the issues on heritage assets. So I think quite helpful guidance there. The other aspect is um, there is no concept of fair value really in the in the conceptual framework at the moment that the EPSSB has issued. So if obviously if they are going to provide guidance on fair value, then we would need to make sure that the conceptual framework is, is consistent. They are in, the, are in the process of developing both of these documents and we think they will be finished. So this is why we really picked this project for the 24-26 work program. In terms of our other strategy of maintaining and enhancing the standards of GRAP, um, we always do the improvements to the standards of GRAP. We do them once every three years. We sort of save up all the amendments that we need to make um, that we've identified either because the international standard has changed or because we've gotten some feedback about maybe potential inconsistencies or things that might require more guidance or whatever the case might be. Um, to the standards, we really try to accumulate them and then we issue an omnibus um, that deals with all the three years worth of changes rather than changing all the time. I think the other thing that we are asking for as part of the uh, maintaining and enhancing the standards is whether or not there are any other minor changes that are needed to the standards to improve their application. And of course, we would be interested in hearing from you if you do have specific issues that you would like us to address as part of our work program. In terms of promoting the adoption of the standards of GRAP, this is really two specific areas. It's promoting the individual adoption of standards of GRAP. Um, so if we issue new standards, so let's say it's the new financial instrument standard, what are we doing really to promote the adoption of that standard amongst our preparers? The other part is really, are there any other entities that need to start applying the GRAP reporting framework? So in, in our instance, in our environment, it is the national and provincial departments that don't yet apply standards of GRAP. 
Um, it's not within our hands, unfortunately. It's the Minister of Finance that needs to determine when exactly the department should start applying GRAP. But I think what we are quite keen to do and have started doing is really raising awareness about the fact that the departments don't apply GRAP um, with the minister and really what it is that we can do to, to get them geared up to do so. Um, well aware that the current system that they have uh, using the modified cash system doesn't give um, them the right information or is, would not give them the right um, implementation, sorry, right information or processes to support accrual accounting. But I think there are a number of other things that we can do on the periphery to, to help. So capacity building, changing policies, processes, etc. So that is something that we will be looking at specifically. And of course, if you have any suggestions about how we can go about promoting the adoption of the standards in a different way, we are happy to hear about that. So I, I think in terms of improving the process, um, obviously this is an aspect where we take a, a step back and have a look at, um, are there any other things that we can do to reflect on, on sort of how we are doing with the standards. And at the moment, we have post implementation reviews and desktop reviews. Um, you would have seen some results from our desktop review of Graph 24 today. And, and the desktop reviews are really geared towards assessing compliance with the standards and identifying emerging issues. On the post implementation review side, this is really a, a full full review, um, assessing whether or not the objective of the standard has been met, consulting with users of the financial statements to understand if they are getting the information that they need, consulting with preparers to identify implementation and application issues, talking to auditors, so really speaking to everybody concerned to understand um, whether or not the standard is achieving its objective. We do one post implementation review every three years and we do two desktop reviews every three years. And what we are really asking is for your feedback on potential topics. Um, there was a question in the chat earlier about when are we going to review Graph 109. It's on our work program already. We'll start doing that in 2022-23. So apart from Graph 109, please send us your suggestions about other uh, standards to review. We obviously, as, as much as we want to take stock during this reporting cycle, there are a number of sort of emerging issues and we would like your feedback on whether or not these are things that we should be looking at. The first one is climate related disclosures. Um, so this is very broad um, for those of you that follow the sort of financial reporting debate in the private sector. There has been a sustainability international sustainability standards board established under the auspices of the IFRS foundation. They will start issuing standards for reporting on environmental sustainability and governance issues. Um, it will deal with sort of reporting outside the financial statements. Um, it will also have a look at though if any of these issues do affect the financial statements very specifically. I think for us that's too broad, um, so the ASB's mandate is really to focus on the financial statements primarily rather than looking at other issues. So I guess what we were asking is that should we start having a look at climate related disclosures and if there is any impact specifically on the financial statements, um, just thinking about things like the municipalities and their landfill sites and illegal dumping and, you know, I think the list goes on and on and on. But I, I think it is something that we could potentially explore, but want to know your feedback on that. We do or we have thought about issuing a document um, outlining the various reporting frameworks that are applied across the economy. So the public and the private sector. I think people are not always very clear when they should apply GRAP or IFRS or IFRS for SMEs or whether or not they actually need a general purpose framework at all and they should just be doing their own thing. So we would actually or we are suggesting that this could be a project for us to take on to to actually put together the reporting framework kind of landscape across the economy and if that would be useful. We have also gotten questions about employee compensation and this is short term compensation specifically. And um, I, I think the dialogue is has been for some time that, you know, there's this sort of expanding or ballooning wage bill in the public sector and whether or not, um, you know, we, we need additional information on employee compensation. So I guess the question is, what is the gap and what should we um, what should we be potentially presenting and disclosing in addition to what we do already? But really would like your views on, on whether or not that would be helpful to users of the financial statements. 
The other thing that we do is facilitate and encourage stakeholder engagement. And, and within this, we really have a look at issuing fact sheets. Um, I, I did include a link in the chat earlier where you can access those for those of you that haven't looked at them previously. It's something new that we started about two or three years ago. Um, we, we don't do it for all projects at this point in time. I think we do it with the more complex ones and where there are a number of questions that have arisen during the development of the document or sort of recur just so that we can kind of keep track of these questions because they do seem to sort of recur as time goes on. So if we have a record of them, then we don't need to deal with them all the time. Um, we also, if you don't subscribe to our newsletter, I would strongly urge you to. You go onto our website, www.asb.co.za, and you click subscribe to our newsletter and you will get it. Um, we do deal with topical um, accounting issues in, in our newsletter, not every week, um, but obviously we will keep you informed of events, what's happening at the IPSSB and, and anything new that is emerging as part of that process. And obviously we've spent quite a lot of time recently focusing on social media uh, and sort of giving you some content that you can engage with um, as you prepare your financial statements. If, if, of course, you have any other suggestions about how we can improve that, please feel free to, to let us know. Um, Amanda started talking about the due process handbook and really um, what, what this entails. It is a... Um, Sorry, yes. just to interrupt you, I am back, so okay, perfect. <laughs> you can continue if you want to. No. <laughs> I don't know how long I'm going to, to be on. Go ahead, Amanda. <laughs> okay, all right. Thanks for taking over. I really appreciate it. And apologies, <laughs> you know, it's it's no, strange no. that it's not Friday the 13th today on my side, so yeah. Okay, thanks, Janine. So, just um, on the new uh, on the due process handbook. So, the board actually undertook a um, project to to have a comprehensive look at the prefaces to the standards of GRAP. We have a preface to the standards. We have a preface to the directives, as well as a preface to the interpretations of GRAP. And the board agreed that we're going to issue a, sing, a single um, comprehensive preface to the standards of GRAP, which is going to be included in all um, in all our pronouncements. But with that being said, um, when we 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 undertook that project, the board actually realized that there's quite a lot of content that is dealing with the due process and the standard setting activities that actually no longer fits into the preface of the um, preface to the standards of GRAP. And hence the board then agreed to issue a separate due process handbook that actually includes requirements relating to the board's standard setting activities. And the objective of this exposure draft is to first in first of all to inform um, stakeholders around the process that the board normally follows when it develops specific accounting standards and other pronouncements, including guidelines and interpretations, directives, um, as well as for them to um, provide comments and inputs onto, into the board's standard setting activities. So I think it's important to note that the um, ASB is established in accordance with the PFMA and that um, and that, um, giving the requirement that we need to introduce generally or develop generally recognized accounting practice for all spheres of government. The due process requirements are really built on four principles. The first one around the objectivity. So for the board to be objective, it needs to be, um, it needs to act objectively in its in its um, deliberations, um, in the decisions that it takes, and in any of the actions. So therefore, it's important for the board to remain independent. The next um, principle is around transparency. So this is really. Um, to say that the board undertakes the standard setting activities in a transparent manner. For that purpose, the board meetings as well as the meetings of the technical committee are open to the public to allow for entities to participate or to not to participate, pardon me, to observe in these meetings. Um, then also the board will consider all the comments received during a specific reporting process or specific due process and, and publish its responses to that comment on, on the website um, to the specific pronouncement to which it relates, unless there is certain confidentiality that is requested. And also the board, as part of its basis for conclusions, will um, include its rationale behind certain decisions that was taken in order to develop uh, the specific pronouncement. And that for all forms part of the principle around the transparency. 
The next one is around the consultation, and this is really to ensure that the pronouncements that are issued by the board are widely um, are consulted so that we obtain um, as the stakeholders' views and comments on the proposed principles set out in the standard. And then lastly, the principles um, of developing standards are based on international influence. So in terms of the legislative requirements, the board needs to look at best practices locally as well as internationally to develop a specific standard of crap. So that's all the due process principles that are all dealt with and explained within this exposure draft. Then the exposure draft also deals with the nature of the pronouncements and it specifies and clarifies that the nature of the pronouncement, whether it is going to be a directive, whether it's going to be a standard or an interpretation or a guideline, it's really based um, on determining and or considering a number of factors. And these, first of all, includes whether the transaction, the balance or the event is dealt with in an existing IPSAS or IFRS. So in terms of this, the board will then adopt the IPSAS and the IFRS and make, make certain local amendments to the standard as it deems appropriate. Um, the next um, criteria is whether the transaction or event exists for which an IPSAS and IFRS has not been developed. And this is typically way back when the board, for example, issued the standard of GRAP on heritage assets when there was no equivalent IPSAS or IFRS for heritage asset. The board developed um, a public sector South African standard to that extent because there wasn't any IPSAS or IFRS that the board could reference to. Then also transitional arrangements or provisions, those are usually set in a directive on the initial adoption of the standards of GRAP. Then the board also considers whether there's specific local guidance needed on how to account for a specific transaction. And again, guidelines and directives are some of the examples that the board use in order to, to develop this type of pronouncement. And then um, the, the last pronouncement is dependent on whether the board intends to communicate the results. And this is usually done through a research report or through a, prog pro a progress report, pardon me. So really the exposure draft explains in detail each type of pronouncement Announcement that is issued by the board and then the secretariat. The pronouncement also deals with the standard setting activities and the standard setting process, explaining that the board, for example, may undertake research and development. The focus take all the consultation in order to, um, if there's no IFRS or IPSAS, in order to obtain comments and views on proposed principles that will be included in an exposure draft. The third phase is really around the approval of the exposure draft, explaining the involvement of the technical committee as well as the board in order to approve the exposure draft. Then the public consultation process where comments and inputs are obtained from stakeholders to, to really get an understanding around the practicality of some of the principles that are proposed within these pronouncements. Then the fifth phase is usually around looking at the comments, again, sharing that with the project group and obtaining their comments and views before it is submitted to the technical committee and board for approval as a final pronouncement. pronouncement. Um, the, the, six, the sixth phase is really around um, the approval of the standard and then also the development of the transitional provisions to assist entities with the first time adoption of a specific standard. And the last phase in the standard setting process is really around the effective date for a specific pronouncement. So in terms of this, the exposure draft explains when um, will the Minister of Finance determine an effective date and when will the board, for example, determine effective date for a specific standard. A pronouncement. Um, other areas that are addressed um, in this exposure draft is first of all how the board will how the board develops its work program. We've just touched on that in terms of ED194, explaining that the board undertakes a formal consultation in order to set its work program for a three-year period. Then um, what the board do the board consider um, to re-expose some of the pronouncements that was issued for comment, but based on the comment received, there's going to be a re-exposure. Janine touched on the improvements to the standards of GRAP, so it also explains what amendments are part of the improvements project. Past implementation review and desktop reviews are really the exposure of explaining what the differences between these two are and when the board will decide when to issue what, um, which type of um, document. And then lastly, the different communication channels that the board um, use in order to share its activities with, um, with, the, with the shareholders. So that is really, um, in short, what the board has agreed in terms of or what the um, ED195 in 96, pardon me, is all about in terms of um, 
the board's due process handbook. Um, as for the um, ED194 on the board's work program, there's a number of consultations that the, that the secretary has set up in order to obtain comments and views from respondents in this regard. So I think the last section for today is just really to give you a snapshot as around what is happening at an international level. So I think importantly to start off with Ipsos 33 on leases, and this is really a project um, that is aligned with an Ipsos that is aligned with IFRS on leases. So the Ipsos introduces the right of use model and replaces it with a risk and reward model for leases. It also introduces new recognition exemptions for um, a lesser or a lessee, saying that in terms of the new requirement, a lessee may elect not to recognize an asset and a liability for a lease with a term of 12 months or less, or when the underlying asset is of a low value. So Ipsos 43 is really the first part of the leases project of the Ipsos B. It has an effective date of 1 January 2025. The second phase will now commence that involves looking at specific public sector, public sector specific leasing issues, such as concessionary leases and arrangements that provide other forms of rights over assets in a specific arrangement or a lease arrangement then. Then around the improvements, a secret pronouncement that has been approved is around the improvements to the Ipsos. This has an effective date of 1 January 2023. And as for the Ips, for the ASB's improvements, it's really minor non-urgent changes, no principal amendments. So improvements will have an effective date of 1 January 2023, except for the improvement relating to interest rate benchmark reforms, which is directly linked to the um, to Ipsos 29 on financial instruments, the recognition and measurement IPSAS in relation to that, um, which has an effective date from 1 January 2022. And this is really um, the earlier comment period for this is a result of the significant number of changes um, in relation to interest rate benchmark reforms. Then the next exposure draft that the IPSAS B has issued, which we will also issue concurrently, is on the um, an update on chapter three dealing with the qualitative characteristics and chapter five dealing with um, elements. The Ipsos B was meant to publish it in January per the work program, but I think it will be published early in February. And as I've said, the, the ASB will then concurrently issue this exposure draft in order to obtain comments and inputs from stakeholders. Some of the proposed amendments or amendments in, um, included in ED81 is really around materiality. So the Ipsos B has taken the revised definition of materiality from the um, IISB and included that in the proposed exposure draft as well as the concept of obscuring information, which was added um, to omitting and misstating information as a factor that could influence the objectives of financial reporting. Then around prudence, and um, that is also discussed in this exposure draft as a reinforcement of neutrality in the contents of the qualitative characteristics um, on faithful representation. Also, the definition of an asset and liability has been aligned with that of the IISB, and it's now a more rights-based approach um, that has been adopted for the description of a resource in the content of an asset. And then lastly, this exposure draft also includes the concepts of um, unit of account. It's a new section um, that, help with the, that will help with the application of the recognition and measurement of IPSAS, and it also includes some guidance around execut executory contracts. In on the subject two pronouncements. Now, first of all, the subject two pronouncement is really a pronouncement that has been approved in principle, but there's just minor outstanding matters or amendments that needs to be approved. So in December, the Ipsos B approved um, ED82 on retirement benefit plans, subject two, so meaning that at the check-in meeting in February, they will finalize the last outstanding matters um, on this exposure draft before it is being issued. So it is expected to be finalized um, in February as part of the check-in meeting. Um, it deals with the accounting and reporting requirements around public sector retirement benefit plans. Um, and although it's not a convergence project, it is based on IIS 26 that deals with accounting and reporting by retirement benefit plans. Just um, lastly on some of the projects in progress, the first one is around natural resources. 
So this is really a consultation paper where they want to fresh out some of the recognition and measurement and presentation and disclosure requirements. The first phase of the consultation paper, which is expected to be approved at the March meeting and which will then also be published locally in order to obtain, obtain comments and inputs, really focuses on the financial reporting for tangible, naturally occurring resources. And this includes subsoil resources, water and living resources, which are found in the natural state. Um, so really the consultation paper considers the, um, the criteria for these natural resources to be recognized in the financial statements, and it briefly discusses the accounting for those natural resources that are not in its natural state, um, natural state and are likely to fall outside the scope of the standard, with the focus being then on certain disclosures in terms of the, um, the recommended practice guidance from, um, from the IPSAS B. Um, on, on land, also, um, um, the, the Ipsos B has agreed not to include the accounting for land as part of the natural resources, because again, in its view, there's sufficient guidance in accounting for land in the other Ipsoses that's already out there. The next project is around revenue and transfer expenses, and this is one of the projects, as Janina has mentioned, that the board has included as part of its work plan consultation, but we need to wait for the Ipsos B to finalise um, the project. The comments received on the revenue and transfer expenses EDs um, was quite diverse, um, and looking at all the issues that they need to deal with, it's most likely that the Ipsos B will again issue the revenue and the transfer expenses standards um, for exposure. Um, and then they have also undertaken a mid-period work program consultation, which they have considered the comments and inputs from. And tentatively, they have agreed to add as a major project, um, a project around the presentation of financial statements, looking again at whether that is really meeting the user's information needs in terms of what is presented in terms of GRAP1. Um, another major project is around differential reporting, so that will be one of the projects that most likely they will take on. Around the minor projects, they will have a look at impairment of non-cash generating um, assets and some concerns that the stakeholders have around that. Also, the development of a practice statement on materiality and then looking at the standard on first-time adoption of IPSAS altogether. Um, as part of the work program consultation, there was also um, a need highlighted for guidance around sustainability reporting. And again, that is one of the questions, um, as Janine has mentioned, that the board has also included in, um, in, in our local work, program, work, work program, pardon me, consultation. Um, for this one, the mid-period work program, they intend to issue a feedback statement on what they're going to um, include in their work program um, that is likely to be approved in March this here. The last one is around the measurement suite of standards, and this was also a standard um, that was issued that involved the IPSAS on measurement, um, that's aligned with IFRS 13 to some extent, the changes to the conceptual framework, and then also changes in IPSAS 17 concerning measurement, concerning um, infrastructure assets and heritage assets, um, but specifically on the measurements, there was mostly support for, for the principles except for the views around the current operational value measurement basis. Now, the current operational measurement basis is a specific measurement basis, public sector measurement basis that the Ipsos B has introduced um, to address the measurement issues associated with assets. Stakeholders on the one hand disagreed with the current operational value as a measurement basis um, because they noted that fair value could be used or it could be adapted or as an alternative replacement cost can be applied. Um, thus, um, the minority really that was in support of that uh, also asked for more clarification around that. So that will definitely be um, some of the issues that the, the Ipsos B will need to deliberate and continue deliberating on in finalising that. Um, so lastly, just to say that the Ipsos B's next check-in meeting, like I've said, is in February, um, but the first full-time meeting is scheduled for the 22nd to the 25th of March. It's likely to be a virtual meeting again, and then it's usually open for um, public observation as well. So with that, Janine, I'm handing back to you. Um, that's all from my side. Thank you very much, everyone. And apologies again for the break due to the large load shedding. Thanks, Janine.
Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, I, I think thank you very much for joining us. Um, apologies for the technical difficulties that we do we did experience. Um, I, I really um, hope that ESCOMP will we'll send them a schedule so that they don't load shit up during our presentations. Um, yep. I think it's it's hard for, for both us uh, and for you, obviously, if this does happen. So, so thank you very much. I really hope you did find the session useful. We have posted the presentation on our website under the Stay Informed page. Um, we have included as many links as we have today, but if you if you are looking for some additional information, please just just email us. I did mention that we have a session um, on the 18th of February to talk about our work program consultation. So if you didn't get a chance to comment today, um, please, we'd love you to join um, and, and obviously for you to share your views. You, you, you got a, a snippet of what it is that we are looking for. So if you can share those with us, it's on the 18th of February. Um, the presentation is available on our website. Um, I think we'll just share the, the link one last time. It has been included in the chat function. But if you are looking for any presentations, please have a look under the Stay Informed tab under on our website, um, asb.co.za, Stay Informed. Um, I would really urge you to subscribe to our newsletter. You would find a lot of the content of what we've spoken about today in some way, shape or form in the newsletter. Again, just go to our website and subscribe. So thank you very much for joining us. I do hope you found the session useful. Um, just for those that are MFMA entities, we will have the same um, presentation um, held in May again. So please just keep a look out for that. But thank you so much and, and really do hope that you enjoyed the session and you found it very useful. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to my colleagues, Amanda and Elisna. Really do appreciate all your effort for this. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Yeah.